Okay, so welcome everybody. My name is Daniel Baumann. Um, I'd like to welcome you on the behalf of the organizing committee. I'm one of them. Uh, the other people here, like Paul Scheller, John Barrow, and Davis, Shingang Chen, um, Anthony Chalander, and yeah, people you know. And so, if you recognize them, they can help you with any any problems you face this this week. Um, I'll have a couple of announcements later, but I don't want to actually delay our proceedings too much right now. But now I just would like to introduce uh, Robert Kennicott, who is the, the head of the School of Physical Sciences at Cambridge. Uh, for the Americans, this is like the dean of the School of Physical Sciences. Um, he also used to be the head of the IOA, the Institute for Astronomy in Cambridge. Um, he's a former Gruber Prize winner, and I'm sure you know, many, many of you know him. Um, so, you know, he kindly agreed to open, open this conference for us. So. Thank you very much, Daniel. Well, it does seem strange to address you as a bureaucrat, and I should be here as an astrophysicist, so I'll try to wear both hats this morning. But on uh, behalf of the university, uh, welcome to the conference. Uh, Cambridge is, is very proud of its astronomy, uh, and in particular, uh, this event, of course, very closely connected with the uh, cosmology group and the Department of Applied Mathematics and Theoretical Physics and Stephen Hawking's uh, Center for Theoretical uh, Cosmology. Uh, we want to acknowledge in particular uh, uh, one of our sponsors, Intel, uh, which has actually been very uh, generous in supporting first uh, Stephen's uh, 70th birthday conference uh, back January a year ago and continues to support events of this sort and also is one of many sponsors of the Cosmos uh, supercomputer uh, project, which some of you may see uh, later on in the, in the meeting. Um, I would uh, be remiss too, and uh, uh, you mentioned uh, the Institute of Astronomy. Uh, just remind you there are actually two other astronomy centers in Cambridge, now both co-located uh, on the same site, uh, at the IOA site, uh, north side of Mattingly Road, about one kilometer uh, west of here. Uh, and in fact, uh, it houses not only uh, Fred Hoyle's original Institute of Astronomy, uh, the Martin Rees and, and co, but also now the Cavendish Astrophysics Group, uh, which is a brand new Batcock Center for Experimental uh, Astrophysics building, uh, just moved into, I think, in the last week or two. So if you have some free time, free afternoon or whatever, feel free and come over and, and drop by and have some coffee there and mingle with some of the other folks. Uh, it's a measure of the uh, activity in astronomy here that uh, you will not see many people from the Cavendish this week because there's a second conference, actually a fest shrift for uh, Malcolm Longair starting tomorrow. And uh, a few people like Anthony Lazenby and myself will be migrating uh, back and forth between the two. But it just uh, illustrates the continuing vibrancy of astronomy here. And anyway, uh, the university is very proud to have you here and, and proud to, uh, to uh, host what ought to be a most productive, I think, and illuminating conference. Thank you. Yes. Um, okay, so we're almost ready to get started. Uh, let me just tell everybody, you might have seen there are these cameras. Um, so the whole thing will be filmed in this room. So be careful what you say if you don't want the rest of the world uh, to hear. Um, in fact, the whole thing will be web streamed. So there's, there's a link on our website that you can tell your friends and family. And um, so there's a, a, the link to YouTube. I don't know how it works, but somehow you can, you can view it live. You can also go to the next. There's an overflow room if you, if you want to watch it from there. Um, and that link will, will be broadcasted there. Uh, and because we're because we're filming, it's also important that if you have questions, that you wait for a mic to come, because although we can hear all of you, uh, the, the, the cameras won't pick it, pick it up if you don't speak into a mic. So there will be this mic, and there will be another mic going around. So if you have a question, just wait a second for this for this mic to come. Okay. So our first speaker um, is Lars Sonnenschein from the University of Aachen. He's going to speak on the behalf of the CMS and Atlas collaboration. And his talk title is uh, Recent Results from the LHC. Can you hear me? Yeah, OK. Is 
So thank you for this opportunity. I'm also proud to be here. And I would like to apologize that I can only show a representative selection of all the newest analysis we have, but you will also see some uh, summaries. Ah, so that's something else you say. Okay, so that's for the, just for the laser pointer. All right, so this is the overview. Um, I will introduce shortly the accelerator and the two experiments, CMS and ATLAS, of which I'm presenting here a lot of results. First, a standard model physics, then we go to a Higgs boson physics, supersymmetry, and then I continue with more exotic searches and, and finish with the heavy iron physics. And then I show some performance projections of the accelerator and uh, the experiments. So first, about the accelerator itself and the experiments. So here you see the LHC accelerator, the 27 kilometer tunnel. And in particular here, the two multipurpose experiments, ATLAS and CMS, indicated here is the data flow. We have about 36% of uh, proton run efficiency. Here you see the integrated and the peak luminosities for the different years. 2010, where we are running with a center of mass energy of seven teraelectron volt. So this plots here and then 2011 and 12, no, oh, sorry, 11 also 7 tera electron volt, and then 12, where we changed to center of mass energy of 8 tera electron volt. So this is a plot here. And this one, where we accumulated over uh, 20 inverse uh, fem to bond integrated luminosity. And the newest results I'm showing are based basically on this uh, 2012 data set. So this here is a CMS detector, you have first your inner tracking system in the case of uh, CMS and full silicon, then you have your calorimeters, and then the solenoid magnet for the bending of the charged particles to determine the momentum of the particles, and then outside you have four layers of muon chambers embedded here in the iron, which is the return yoke to focus the magnetic flux inside the detector, and then you have a stronger magnetic field. And similar, the atlas detector, if you compare it, it has four to five times the volume of the CMS detector. So that's the biggest detector in the world. Here you see the hardware performance of the different subsystems and sub detectors of uh, CMS and Atlas detectors. And the good news is that on average, we have uh, 98 of the channels are operational. That makes it easier for the reconstruction and uh, comparison of our data to the simulation. Now here you see the scale of energy flux of the particle as a function of, of the particle energy. So that's presumably more familiar to you than to me. I only have indicated here, uh, translated into the center of mass energy for proton-proton collider here, uh, where we uh, see the LHC energy and reach. And here you have the kinematic plane. Uh, in virtuality and uh, proton momentum fraction x. And this is here the reach uh, of LHC. And then indicated here is also the Auger kinematic limit. And here you have a large phase space area at uh, low proton momentum x, which means forward physics and also diffractive uh, physics. And then also at a low virtuality here, which corresponds to non perturbative physics, in particular underlying event. When you look at diffractive physics, that means that you have a colorless uh, exchange between the uh, two protons. In this case, here, single diffraction where you have here a rapidity gap without activity between one uh, proton which stays intact, and then here, the hard scattering where you expect jets and other particles flying into the detector. Then you can have here a double proton exchange where you have two rapidity gaps, and here, a double diffraction where you have then a rapidity gap between the two protons and then the hard scattering of the two protons in forward direction. So this is uh, the CMS experiment where you have also implemented here uh, the totem experiment, which consists of the telescopes here, T1, T2, and then you have also Roman pots, which cover the very forward region. Here you have the pseudo range indicated. And then I'm going to show you two example analysis, which are 
covering this uh, phase space, which is also interesting and important for astrophysics. So here you see the uh, pseudo rapidity and leading transfer momentum distributions of charged particles. This here is with a central detector of CMS, and this here is then with the uh, totem telescopes, which is being measured. And uh, here you see the transverse momentum distribution of the leading jet. And here you see also for different experiments, starting here with uh, UA, also Ellis and, and CDF, and then the latest uh, CMS experiments here, which is uh, with non-single diffractive uh, enriched, which means that you expect tracks in both T2 telescopes of the totem experiment. This here is another example um, where you measure here low transit momentum inclusive jet cross sections, which you are uh, measuring in the forward region. And this was here a dedicated particular run. You see a low luminosity where you had a little amount of minimum bias events, so low pile up conditions. And then you cover here the low transit momentum energies between uh, 21 and 74 uh, GeV. And here you have indicated then the differential cross section in seven different uh, rapidity bins. And uh, both are in good agreement with uh, predictions from theory compared to next to leading order calculations. Then I come to standard model physics. This here is uh, differential inclusive jet cross section. So that's the right part we have already seen in the plot before, but that's now uh, perturbative uh, in, in the central part of the detector which is in, in six rapidity bins. And again, you see a comparison here, superposed next to leading order. It's in good agreement when you show the data over theory ratio, you can try to distinguish for different pattern distribution functions. And here you see it for neural network PDFs, which are in good agreement with the data. And here you have another example of uh, ABM11 PDFs, which are excluded by this measurement already. This here shows you a multi-jet cross-section measurement from ATLAS. This is uh, the ratio of the three-jet to two-jet inclusive uh, cross-section as a function of the leading transverse met, uh, jet momentum. Again, in agreement with the data, and then you can extract alpha S for the uh, relatively high transverse momentum jets. And here you see then uh, all the different experiments and uh, the world average indicated, which is consistent with the newest measurement of ATLAS, which goes here to the highest uh, virtuality scales measured yet for alpha s. Here you see summary plots from CMS and ATLAS of vector boson and top pair production. And again, everything is consistent with the standard model expectations. You have an example of a ZZ production cross-section. What you see in this plot here is the leading lepton pair invariant mass to the sub-leading lepton pair mass. And like the data points, consists of the distribution here with a simulation with two Zs and two four leptons. And here you have uh, the latest measurements from ATLAS, which is on this curve here for PP collisions. And this here is for PP bar collisions, where you have also the old measurements of Tevatron again. It's in very good agreement with standard model expectation. And then one interesting thing you can look at is anomalous triple and quartic gauge couplings, which you see here indicated for different experiments. And uh, you see it's all consistent with the standard model so far. There are further uh, couplings, WZZ, Z gamma gamma, ZZ gamma, and uh, triple Z. I cannot show here, but they are all consistent with the standard model expectations. So now I'm getting to a heavy flavor of physics. I'm going to show you first here uh, our dedicated uh, diamond triggers, which enhance the statistics, in particular interesting for uh, J size, B sub S, and also upsilons. And here you have one measurement from Atlas where you measure B sub S into J psi phi. And from this measurement, you can then extract the decay with difference between the light and heavy states and uh, the weak phase phi S. So here you see the invariant mass distribution, your uh, reconstructed signal here when it's abstracted uh, background. And here you have the 
uh, proper decay distributions of the particles, and here you have then the extracted decay with difference as a function of this uh, angle phi s. This is a standard model prediction, and the measurement is consistent with the standard model. And the interesting thing uh, for this measurement is that this angle phi s is related to the uh, CKM matrix angle here, this minus 2 beta s. And the prediction of the standard model is that this uh, value is small. And so you hope if there would be new physics, which you could uh, recognize indirectly, it could contribute into loops, and then of uh, course here a higher uh, value of this angle phi s. But right now it seems to be consistent with the standard model. So now I'm coming to the B sub s and B sub d into mu plus mu minus pair uh, measurement from CMS. So it's also interesting because this decay mode is highly suppressed in the standard model, and then uh, you measure the branching ratios of uh, both B sub S and B sub D. Again, it looks uh, to be consistent with the standard model. Here if you have 30 years of history of this measurements, and here indicated are the standard model expectations, and right now we have reached here the standard model cross-section, and we have here a first measurement from CMS with uh, 4.3 sigma and a smaller significance for B sub D decay. And when we combine this measurement with the latest measurement of LHC, then uh, we get even the observation of this decay channel, which is uh, consistent with the standard model expectation for B sub D. It's not yet statistically significant. You see a compilation of different experiments and measurements for B sub S and B sub D. In green, here is the expectation of the standard model. And at the bottom, you see the latest measurement of the CMS plus LHCB combination. Then we come to top crop physics. So TG bar production is dominated by gluon gluon fusion, about 90% at the LHC. And you have the diagrams of single top production dominated in cross section by the T channel. Then you have here the TW channel and the S channel. So what you see here are the latest uh, measurements from ATLAS for a single top production cross-section. Again, you see here this is the uh, serial prediction for PP bar, uh, no, sorry, for a proton proton, and this here is PP bar, so that's uh, indicating here the Tevatron, old measurements from Tevatron uh, measurements. And uh, here you have the latest ATLAS and also the previous uh, at last measurement combination. And here from CMS in comparison to next to next to leading order approximated, and we are already in, in possession of the full next to next to leading order prediction that will uh, in, increase the accuracy. So we have only here an uncertainty then in the future of 4%, which allows to uh, probe the gluon density inside the proton. Here you have an example of a jet shape measurement from ATLAS which gives you information of the uh, momentum flow, momentum distribution inside the jet around the jet axis. And the basic information you extract here is that the light quark jets are narrower in this distribution compared to the B quark jets. You have uh, single top production cross sections in the different channels from ATLAS. And here you have from CMS the measurement of top versus anti-top single top production this is the measurement, and here you have the theory comparison for different pattern distribution functions, and that's also consistent with standard model expectation within the errors. So for the T-channel single top production measurements, we uh, reach uncertainty between 30-90%, and for the uh, matrix element VTB, it's about 10%. Here you have compilation of top mass, Measurements from CMS and from ATLAS also indicated here the Tevatron combination. And the good news is that we are reaching the Tevatron precision right now. So the systematic uncertainties go below this uh, 1 GV threshold. And there are many other ex uh, experimental results, but this is too much for today. can only invite you to show at the um, public physics results webpage from Atlas and CMS. Now I come to uh, the Higgs, standard model Higgs analysis. So the dominating cross-section you have uh, from the gluon-gluon fusion processes, and then you can have Higgs radiation within the vector boson, TG bar fusion, and also uh, W to Z fusion. 
So here you have the um, Higgs production mechanisms. The yellow line here indicates where we have measured the a new boson-like particle. This here shows you for the different center of mass energies of the LHC accelerator, how the cross-section evolves. Here you have the different decay modes, <coughs> branching ratios, and this here is uh, splitted for the different uh, dye boson decay modes, which each have a separated analysis channel. In this table here, you see the uh, analysis which are pursued, the most prominent ones this year, uh, hex of the VB bar and tau tau. They have the highest number of events, but they have also the largest background, so the uh, signal over background ratio is rather low, and the mass resolution is uh, not very good. So this measurements you use typically for uh, measuring couplings and uh, branching ratios, but when you want to go to discovery, and uh, the high uh, mass precision measurement, then you go here to Higgs to gamma gamma and Higgs to Z bosons, where you reach here in mass resolution at uh, 126 GB, where I found the particle uh, of one to two percent. There are further channels which are being analyzed. But these are the dominant ones in the blue table. And here you see an example analysis. This is a, a measurement of Higgs boson into two Z bosons, and then for leptons, and you can clearly see the signal, so the local significance of this signal here corresponds to 6.7 sigma for the single measurement, and the signal strength is consistent with the standard model expectation. And here you see a plot uh, to verify the spin parity of the particle, so this here in orange is uh, for a scalar boson, which is favored, an pseudo-scalar boson is uh, disfavored, as you can see here. So the red arrow here is indicating our measurement at CMS. And also a spin-2 hypothesis is uh, strongly disfavored. And furthermore, this range here from 130 to 827 GV is excluded. So we are not seeing there any further standard model Higgs boson-like particle. And you have here another example, this is a Higgs to gamma gamma channel from Atlas, where you use a boosted decision tree and distinguish the three different production mechanisms here. And then uh, you combine the results afterwards, and here you have the invariant uh, mass distribution. And here the background subtracted, you see this clear signal, and here the local p values from the measurements uh, 7 TV, 8 TV, and also the combination. And that gives you uh, your local significance of 7 point for sigma. Then you see here some results of the signal strength couplings. So this is for the different uh, decay modes of the Higgs boson. And all these measurements indicate here that it's consistent with the standard model. And you have the different uh, coupling strengths times the branching ratio. You have your three different measurements indicated from Higgs and all uh, are consistent with the expectation of the standard model, which is indicated here. And here you have uh, coupling strengths in the two fermions and uh, vector bosons. And again, it indicates that it's consistent with the standard model expectations. So here I'm showing you uh, projections, what we would be able to uh, gain in accuracy when we go to 300 inverse femtobands at a uh, center of mass energy of 14 teraelectron volt. So the large green bars you see here for the branching ratios of the Higgs and here the couplings. This is uh, from uh, ISHAP 2012 for status of the analysis and performance. And then you see that we could shrink the errors by a factor between two and four. It depends on the particular measurement. But that's uh, what we expect to improve when we increase the uh, statistics when we start in 2015 again with the LHC. So now I'm coming to supersymmetry. First, the uh, phenomenology. So we have the typically uh, heavy flavor jets, leptons, taus, photons, and uh, visible, typical uh, lighter supersymmetric particle, which gives rise to missing transverse energy. And that's in, in the apparity uh, conservation models. And you can have, of course, also uh, apparity violation where the LSP will decay. 
And then you can have uh, also a search for long enough particles, for example, if the couplings are weak, as uh, in the case for a party violation, Gravitino and mass degeneracy, where you can have then uh, particles which decay after a uh, considerable um, amount of time, and that would be uh, resolvable then hopefully in the tracker volume of our detectors. And you have the different uh, production modes, the cross-section, it's dominated here by this particle pair production, so this is uh, one big industry of search, and then you uh, go here to the next uh, biggest, this is third generation, uh, search for uh, squarks and uh, also leptons, this is natural SUSY driven, we have a look in particular to stops and uh, spotum production, directly or via gluons. And then uh, the lowest one is here, electroweak production, where you look uh, for gay genus and uh, also sleptons. And all these uh, different channels, you can assume uh, a parity conserved or violated and also uh, prompt or long-lived particle decays. And I show you two example analysis. So this one here is from CMS. We have spotum and stop production, where you have then in the final state here, uh, heavy flavor jets. And here you see an example event where you have there uh, five jets and then a few of them b tagged And here you see the exclusion limits in the plane of uh, the lightest neutrino as a function of the uh, gluino mass. And the same here for the uh, stop search. And you see that we can set limits here which go slightly <laughs> above the terra electron wall channel. This here is a search for child genus from uh, Atlas, an interesting analysis where you assume uh, almost a mass degeneracy with the lightest uh, sparticle, and uh, then the child geno has a considerable uh, lifetime and it's uh, expected to be decaying in the uh, tracker volume, and then you have here a typical disappearing track signature, and uh, that's what you are looking at, and here you have the exclusion limit the decay time as a function of the mass of the char genome. And that's what is uh, excluded here in this area. This here is a summary of a different uh, supersymmetric measurements. This is here for direct stop production. Here you have uh, electroweak production. And here you see uh, for gluino production. And here in the, in the m Tsugra plane, M1 half versus M0 all the different measurements and the phase space which is already excluded. And you have a summary. So it's uh, plenty. These are all the latest uh, measurements we have. It's too tiny to recognize something, but uh, you can look at it on your laptop. And if you go, uh, go to the web page from Atlas and CMS, then uh, you can find this and also all the measurements. <coughs> then I come to the exotic measurements. This is a search for dark matter in the mono lepton channel. So the idea is here to have a dark matter pair candidate which is produced and then you have a W boson which decays leptonically and then you can have here also this Feynman graph and in this model is not fixed the uh, possible superposition of the two Feynman graphs. So you have here a, a psi which in, in the models considered here can have the interference values minus one, zero or plus one and here you have the transverse mass distribution and then you see superposed here over data and the standard model expectation the three different uh, models and values. And then you have here exclusion limits for the energy scale lambda as a function of the sky mass. And at the bottom here you see for spin independent the chi nucleon cross section uh, limits as a function of the chi mass. This is this measurement here. That's an uh, other mono uh, jet measurement which is uh, stronger and then you have your dedicated experiment limits indicated. And this is another experiment to the result from uh, ATLAS. Dark matter pair production. So again, you have here uh, a dark matter uh, pair and then you have the W boson which is supposed to decay hadronically and it strongly boosts. So basically you are looking for one jet in your uh, event. And then you have here the distribution of the invariant jet mass. Again, uh, data compared to simulation, standard model expectation and then here different models, uh, D5 operators here. And then you see here again exclusion limits, the chi nucleon cross section limits as a function of the chi mass. And this uh, is here for the D9 operator, the observed limit. And then again, other experimental results here indicated. So this is a search for microscopic black holes. 
this is the daimyon channel where you look for like sign daimyons. So the muons allow you to reveal strongly the multi jet background, and then daimyon uh, like sign allows you to reveal strongly a TT bar and dibosome production background, for example. And then you have here the distribution of the uh, track multiplicity, and then indicated here a possible model signal. And here we have an exclusion limit of the black hole a threshold mass as a function of the fundamental Planck mass. And then you have here uh, excluded because the fundamental Planck mass has to be below this uh, threshold. And then you have here the different limits for different extra dimensions. So these are again uh, limits of all the uh, exotic measurements. This time, uh, as an example here from the CMS results, in particular here contact interactions, you see the limits on this uh, energy scale lambda go up to 14 TeV. So last topic on analysis here is heavy ion physics. This here are two particle correlations where we look at long range near side angular correlations. Here we have the plots are indicating the azimuthal angle difference between the two particles and the uh, pseudo rapidity difference between the two particles. And you see here this typical ridge that's for lead, -lead collisions and for proton lead collisions where it's more pronounced and the findings might help to get a clearer picture of the earliest moments of the universe. And uh, the present understanding is that this, uh, what we are seeing here, is a consequence of an explosion of a droplet of quark gluon plasma. This here is a measurement from ATLAS, where you go beyond two particles, so you have multi-particle azimuthal correlations, and you split it in six bins of uh, transverse energy sum into the uh, lead beam direction, and then you see here uh, let me just pick out this uh, example here with a second order harmonic. Here's the data. The different models are apparently able to describe the shape more or less, but you see that the data is uh, much higher. And that's evidence for the importance of the final state effects in uh, proton lead collisions. So then I come to the prospects. This is a timeline here. Right now we're on the long shutdown uh, one. And uh, April 2015, we are expecting uh, to start again. And then we will switch from ATV to uh, presumably 13 teraelectron volt center of mass energy. And then we are uh, running until uh, 2018, where we have the long shutdown two. And we are going to reach then uh, the nominal luminosity. And after the long shutdown two, we are uh, doubling then the luminosity. And then we start with the so-called phase two where we want uh, to improve the luminosity with a high luminosity upgrade of the LHC further, where we then hope to get uh, 250 inverse fem to band per year. You have an example of uh, level one trigger upgrades. Uh, so you see uh, two scenarios, 50 nanoseconds, which we were running until February this year, and then in the future, presumably, we are going to switch here to 25 nanoseconds. Then you see improvement of the upgrades compared to what is installed now for the different Higgs decay channels. So this here is uh, <clears throat> the high luminosity upgrade where we are continue running in the LHC tunnel uh, starting presumably in 2022. And then we will expect about 10 times more uh, Higgs bosons. Center of mass energy is supposed to be 14 teraelectron volt, but we will have five times more luminosity as we will have uh, when we start in April 2015 again. And here you have some simulation examples. What we expect with 3,000 inverse fem to barn in this high luminosity uh, run. You can uh, handle here the rare signal channels like TTH, for example. Here you can see the signal or here uh, Higgs into muon muon. Here the uh, expected background subtracted where you can really see something. And also uh, vector boson scattering, which is interesting because Unity would be violated if there would be no damping from the Higgs, but there could be additional damping from uh, new physics. And therefore, it's interesting to check here for uh, resonances at the TEF scale. This here is high luminosity uh, for Higgs. So we have here the different Higgs decay channels. And this here is comparing the decrease of the errors uh, when we go from C and inverse fem to bar to 3000 inverse fem to bar at this uh, high luminosity configuration. And this here is for the partial decay widths. So there's a lot of improvement to be expected. These are um, prospects for a high energy large hadron collider. So you would use the same LHC tunnel again, 
but you would increase then the uh, center of mass energy to uh, 33 tera electron volt and the same luminosity. And therefore, we need to have uh, 20 Tesla dipole magnets in the tunnel. So the limitation right now is not the acceleration. Actually, we could go to higher energies, but we are not able to keep the, the particles in the ring. So therefore, we would need to uh, place there in the tunnel stronger magnets. And then beyond, one possible option would be the very large Hadron Collider that could be an 80 kilometer tunnel in the Geneva area. So this here is uh, the LHC tunnel. And then uh, we could reach an energy of up to uh, about 100 tera electron volt. Thank you. OK, so we have time for a few questions, if there are any. Yeah, do um, Atlas and CMS have uh, measurements of B0 to K star gamma, gamma gamma? You know, LHCb has this uh, strange angular distributions for the decay products. I know that there are the last couple of days there came a new measurement out, but I think it's it's not uh, with gamma gamma. Uh, sorry, mu plus mu minus is what I mean. Sorry, K star mu plus mu minus. Yeah, there, there are the, the last days that carry a new measurement out. But it's, uh, I, I, I have to check if it's still preliminary. It might be that I saw the email yesterday or two days ago. I mean, I think it's LHCB that f sees this strange angular distribution, so I wondered, wondered if it confirms those or, or not. Yeah, there's no, no statement yet as far as I know. This is a complicated analysis where you have time-dependent uh, angular uh, analysis, and that needs typically a lot of understanding. And you see this also in this uh, atlas analysis we have seen. It's a very complicated where you have three-dimensional phase space for the fitting, and uh, a lot of things need to be understood before you can really be confident that what you're measuring is not... and technical particularity of, of your fitting procedures. But as far as I know, there, there's, so either it, it came out eventually Saturday, or you have still to wait. In general, I think Atlas has uh, less uh, handle to, to measure this because they, uh, don't have this uh, inner tracking system in silicon. You see here also the uh, Atlas measurements are typically uh, worse and behind from CMS. This is a very complicated analysis. Yep. Do you have a, do you have a more general uh, sense of where the field's heading? I mean, I noticed that you had a time scale, you, know, you have a timeline through to 2030 and then presumably beyond um, with regard to the VLHC. And I mean, that's reaching the point where we have a time scale that's probably possibly greater than the career of the average scientist in the field in terms of how this is mapped out. And I was wondering, you know, I mean, I mean, if you really wanted to do something, I mean, is this a sign that accelerated technology in some sense you know, can't, can't be scaled indefinitely? And, and where would you see the field going next if you wanted to get to really high energies? I mean, is there any, I mean, what, what would be the, um, now, the more disruptive technologies that might allow us to pursue these things at you know, greater energies than you know, sort of you know, hundreds of TV potentially. Yeah, beyond hundreds of TV, there's a, a big industry for improvement of accelerator technology that you don't need 30 kilometers, but you could do it maybe on a few hundred meters. And, and that, that's ongoing in particular in the United States where they have now uh, shut down the most uh, leading accelerators at Slack and at, at Tevatron. Uh, beyond that, one big improvement would also be if we would have high temperature superconductivity for macroscopic uh, magnets. When I mean, you have it in the laboratory for, for small pieces, but they behave like porcelain, and you cannot uh, build their 15 meter long magnets. And if we would have that, that would life and, and uh, budget that everything would uh, make life easier because uh, we wouldn't need this uh, expensive helium anymore. 
Right now at CERN, they have about half the, the uh, industrial available helium resource for the 27 kilometer fridge. <laughs> so the, the helium, in fact, is the limiting, I mean, it's the sort of rate limiting step at CERN as much as anything else. So concerning the acceleration, the limitation is the, the strength of the dipole magnets. Right. And the point is, of course, every year it improves a little bit, but it would not be worth the effort to replace now the eight Tesla dipole magnets by nine or 10 Tesla dipole magnets. So you have to wait until the technology, uh, we are able to achieve 20 Tesla magnets, and then you would replace it because it would take another uh, few years shut down. Because in 2001, they, they have uh, stopped with a large electron position collider, and in 2008, the LHC has started. So that's not something which you can do in half a year or so. OK, so let's thank Lars again. Okay, so our next speaker is John Ellis from King's College and CERN, and he's going to talk about Higgs physics and cosmology a bit. Yeah, this is uh, advanced work. So I uh, regularly offer a small prize for whoever knows where this picture was taken, but uh, don't think anybody's actually won it yet. Sorry? No. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, my, talk, my job is to uh, somehow make the connection between uh, what you just heard from Lars and uh, cosmology, which is uh, the main interest of this uh, group here. And uh, I'm going to obviously talk quite a bit about the Higgs boson, but not exclusively. I'll also talk about supersymmetry, and I'm going to try to make the connection with uh, inflationary cosmology also. So I should start with... Uh, this, this is uh, the papers that were published back in 1964 uh, about electroweak symmetry breaking and in particular predicting the existence of a Higgs boson. I, I'd like to draw people's attention, by the way, to uh, this paper here, which actually came out the following year, 1965, uh, paper written by two 19-year-old Russian theorists, Migdal and Polyakov, which uh, actually did a very complete job on the Engler, Brout, Higgs, Goralnik, Hagen, Kibble mechanism. Um, and their, the publication of their paper was delayed for quite some time because the uh, old farts of the Russian Academy couldn't believe that two 19-year-olds would come up with something so fundamental. Anyway, so with all these people who uh, came up with this idea for giving masses to elementary particles, you might be forgiven for wondering, well, why is it that we call it the Higgs boson? And the answer is because of all these people, Peter Higgs was the only one who actually mentioned the possible existence of a massive scalar particle. So that was back in 1964. Uh, my own interest in this uh, started uh, back in 1975 when I wrote this paper with uh, Mary Gaillard and Dimitri Ninopoulos. And uh, at that time, you know, this whole thing was extremely speculative. Uh, nobody was taking the thing seriously at all. Nobody had any idea what the mass of the Higgs boson might be. And uh, for that reason, we wrote at the end of our paper, we don't want to encourage big experimental searches for the Higgs boson. <laughs> Fortunately, our uh, excellent advice was not uh, taken by the experimental colleagues. So uh, Lars has already uh, shown you a lot of data on the, uh, on the Higgs boson. Uh, I can tell you, this is a, you know, a very exciting moment for us uh, particle physicists. Uh, in particular, Peter Higgs, who seems to be trying to calm his heart palp palpitation. OK, so uh, as Lars has already told you, uh, experiments looked for the Higgs boson of a, a large range of masses. Uh, so I'll show you an unofficial compilation of the data as they were uh, on March of this year. They haven't changed very much since then. You see you know, nothing very much over a large range of masses, but then uh, here, when you uh, take away the, the blind, 
you see this uh, very significant peak, which is, uh, I know what it is, 11 sigma, 12 sigma, something like that, indisputable. And uh, as we all believe it's the Higgs boson, but of course, this needs to be checked. So, so Lars told you a little bit about some of the checks that have been done. Uh, I, I would compare the situation to uh, you've been doing this particle jigsaw puzzle for uh, 49 years, and uh, you finally found this bent piece of cardboard in the back of the sofa, and the picture's rubbed off, and the question is, uh, does it have the right shape, does it have the right size to be the Higgs boson? So, so the right size uh, in my book translates into the question, uh, does this thing have the same coupling strengths as what you would expect for a Higgs boson? So, so Lars has told you, showed you some individual data from uh, Atlas and CMS, uh, this is a compilation that I did with my PhD student, Tivong Yu, where we combined the data from the LHC experiments and also from the Tevatron experiments in uh, the various different channels that, uh, that Lars mentioned, decays into BB bar, tau tau, gamma gamma, WW, ZZ, and so on, and this is the combined thing. So if you can read it, it says that combined, the overall signal strength is 1.02 plus or minus something like 0.12. So this thing... Uh, very much resembles a standard model Higgs boson, and I'm sure Peter Higgs is smiling at, at least until the uh, Nobel Prize announcement in October. <laughs> so, uh, Tivong, you and I also display the impact of all these various different measurements in a plane which represents the couplings to uh, uh, bosons and to uh, fermions. So that the, uh, the fermions are the vertical axis C, the bosons are the horizontal axis A, and uh, the little green star represents the standard model prediction, and uh, the various different observations uh, constrain these parameters in various different ways. If you put everything together, this is the uh, final global combination, and uh, the little bright spot here, this is what the data are telling you. The data are telling you that this thing really does resemble a standard model Higgs boson. Th these yellow lines, by the way, these are sort of rival theories, composite models, uh, you no, know, whatever. Uh, well, some of those models are compatible with the data, but if and only if they look extremely much like a standard model Higgs boson. So uh, with Tavong, we also looked at the data in a somewhat different way. So it's absolutely crucial that the Higgs boson should couple to other particles proportional to their masses. So we did a fit where we looked to see whether the couplings are proportional to mass to the power 1 plus epsilon with an overall scaling parameter, which might not necessarily be the conventional electroweak scale. And uh, so the standard model corresponds to epsilon equal to 0 and a scale of 246 GV. That's the red line there. And you can see the data are in mind-bogglingly good uh, agreement with that, the uh, fit that we get is this dashed line here with a dotted line for the one sigma excursion. So uh, on the strength of that, we wrote in one of our papers that this particle certainly walks and quacks like a Higgs boson. Okay, so that's the good news. On the other hand, uh, there are a lot of dogs that uh, did not bark. And uh, Lars showed you an, an impressive uh, collection of various different searches for new physics at the LHC, which so far haven't found anything. Um, I don't know whether people still read Sherlock Holmes. Uh, if you read the, uh, the story about uh, Silver Blaze, and uh, the most important clue there is uh, the dog that did not bark. And this is a typical conversation between uh, Sherlock and some stupid policeman. Uh, anything else you want to point out to me? Well, the, the curious incident of the dog in the night time. Policeman. But the dog didn't do anything in the night time. That was a curious incident. And so, you know, we're somewhat in the same situation uh, here at the LHC. Uh, you know, the Higgs boson has appeared, but we haven't yet found you know, all the other physics that uh, you know, we theorists have been speculating about for decades. Uh, maybe you cosmologists can uh, help, out, help us out on that. So, so let me fill out this point in a little bit more detail. So the LHC has shown us a relatively light Higgs boson. 
weighing about 125 GeV, but nothing else up to, as you saw in Lars's talk, uh, TeV uh, energies. So the question arises, if there is something else light, uh, why haven't we seen it? For example, Lars mentioned this extremely rare decay of Bs into mu plus mu minus. This is something where many theories predicted that there might be something beyond the standard model showing up, but nothing did show up. looks very much like the standard model. On the other hand, if there is nothing light at all, then it becomes problematic to understand why the Higgs boson you know, has this sort of mass gap relative to all this other new physics. And uh, this is often phrased in terms of uh, very simple perturbative diagrams, uh, like these here. You write down one loop diagram, um, and if you calculate that in the standard model, you get an enormous contribution. And uh, if you want to get a relatively light Higgs boson, it has to be cancelled out by something new. That would seem to require you know, additional physics, some new approximate symmetry, and nothing of that sort has shown up so far. So you know, that's, the, uh, that's the puzzle that, that we have. Now, I, I said that uh, you know, the dog has not barked. Well, maybe the dog hasn't barked, but that has perhaps been a little bit of a uh, sniffle from some dog. So let me come back to the measurements of the uh, Higgs mass and the top quark mass that Lars mentioned in his talk. So uh, Higgs, as I mentioned, is a very uh, you know, delicate object. And one of the thing, aspects in which it's delicate is that if you try to extrapolate the standard model up to high energies, uh, there's a danger that the Higgs coupling might actually blow up. Now, that would have happened if the Higgs mass had been too large. In fact, of course, the Higgs mass is relatively small. In that case, another catastrophe happens, which is that the renormalization by the heavy top quark that Lars told you about could actually drive the Higgs self-coupling negative. And this introduces an instability in the electroweak vacuum. And uh, this uh, instability is calculated to set in somewhere around 10 to the 10, 10 to the 13 GeV. So this is you know, perhaps the first interface with cosmology. You know, if you take this seriously, the measurements of M Higgs and M top, and if there's no new physics, our current vacuum is unstable, and the universe will descend into a big crunch sometime in the future. Unless, of course, we have some new physics such as supersymmetry. I'll come back to that later. So this is uh, a little bit more detail on this. Maybe we just focus on the right-hand picture here. So a horizontal axis M Higgs, vertical axis M top. The green region, that's the stable region. You know, nothing for your grandmother to worry about. Uh, this yellow region here, this is where the vacuum is in principle unstable, although the lifetime will be very much longer than the age of the universe. And the current indications are that we're living in this unstable region, which is uh, you know, maybe bad news for your grandmother, but it's good news for us particle theorists. So how would you set about stabilizing this electroweak vacuum? What sort of new physics would you introduce? So uh, this instability, I remind you, is driven by a heavy fermion, the top quark. So let's put in a heavy scalar and cancel it out. Well, that's fine, but then you get the same problem all over again, that the coupling might either blow up or it might collapse. So you better put in some new physics to stabilize that as well. And uh, I studied this with uh, Douglas Ross a few years ago, and we finished up with a theory which looked very much like supersymmetry. So that's one of the reasons why uh, whenever I'm asked what else is there out on the particle physics horizon uh, beyond the Higgs boson, I respond supersymmetry, and uh, I've written supersymmetry in the largest possible font that fits on the slide. So actually, I would say that the discovery of the Higgs at the LHC has given us at least two additional reasons for liking supersymmetry beyond those that we had before. There's the successful prediction for the Higgs mass. Supersymmetry predicted that it should weigh less than 130 GeV. Uh, there is uh, a successful prediction for the Higgs couplings. Uh, in the sort of typical sort of supersymmetric theory that we're talking about, the coupling should be within a few percent of the standard model values. Uh, and all of this, of course, is in addition to all the traditional arguments, the sensitivity of the Higgs mass that I mentioned earlier on, and, of course, the fact that you know, it could explain the dark matter in the universe. So 
uh, lots of nice reasons for believing in supersymmetry. Uh, on the other hand, uh, as I think Feynman once said, if you had one very good reason, you wouldn't need to quote lots of reasons. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about uh, supersymmetric dark matter, although uh, Malcolm Fairbairn, replacing Stefano Profumo, will t talk about dark matter in more detail uh, shortly. So in a supersymmetric theory, uh, many supersymmetric theories, there is a uh, conserved quantum number which uh, guarantees that the lightest supersymmetric particle is stable. This is first pointed out by uh, Faye back in the 1970s. Uh, so this multiplicatively conserved quantum number tells you that particles should be produced in pairs, heaviest particles decay into lightest particles, and this, of course, means that the lightest one, since it doesn't have a legal decay mode, could be around today as a relic from the Big Bang. So this is a relatively generic uh, feature of uh, supersymmetric theories. Let me just show you what happens in the simplest possible supersymmetric theory, just as a sort of representative of, of that class. So I, I assume here that the lightest supersymmetric particle is uh, a supersymmetric partner of some combination of photons and Higgs bosons and uh, Z bosons. And uh, there's a bunch of constraints there in uh, brown, green, and pink, which come from various different accelerator experiments. Let me not go into the details of those. Uh, there's a constraint coming from the LHC, the fact that, as last told you, we haven't seen supersymmetric particles there yet. And uh, then there are regions of parameter space where you can get the right dark matter density. So in this particular model, there's uh, a strip along here, another strip along there. You might say, well, you know, those strips look very you know, thin and narrow, right? I mean, this looks like it's kind of fine-tuning. That fine-tuning is the responsibility of you, our dear cosmological friends. And uh, in particular, it was the W macro experiment which gave a fantastically tight constraint on the relic density, which meant that you know, only a small fraction of any model of parameter space would give you the right amount of dark matter. So this is another uh, example of uh, supersymmetric parameter space, which uh, in this case, the uh, W map and a Planck compatible region looks a little bit uh, more impressive. So uh, as Lars has told you, uh, LHC experiments have uh, looked uh, for dark matter. In, in particular, they look for events with uh, missing energy carried away uh, prospectively by dark matter particles. It's actually a relatively generic search, although I'm going to look at it in the context of supersymmetry. Uh, and this is an event observed by CMS. So uh, lots of you know, stuff coming out the top part of the detector, nothing visible coming out the bottom part of the detector. Just exactly the sort of thing which uh, you know, we would love to see. Unfortunately, uh, this is completely compatible with the standard model, no evidence for anything beyond. So uh, Lars already showed you somewhat subliminally uh, a compilation of the various different uh, LHC constraints. Uh, this was how they were uh, in the middle of last year. This is uh, how, they, how they are now. Um, so lots and lots of searches, as he's told you. Uh, there's a couple of different supersymmetric mass scales, one on the vertical axis, one on the horizontal axis. Uh, if you can read what's written here, it's telling you that squarks and guinos probably weigh more than uh, one or one and a half TV. So with uh, some of my colleagues from Imperial College and elsewhere, we've been trying to compile all the constraints on supersymmetry. And uh, so again, this is the unseen scalar mass scale, the unseen fermion mass scale. Green star is the best point, uh, best fit point. Red region, those are 68% confidence level regions. Blue, that's 95% confidence level. So uh, that was actually before the very latest uh, atlas constraints that uh, Lars so showed you. Uh, this is actually where the atlas constraints would fit in this plane. So we haven't actually done a global fit, including these latest data yet. That's uh, in our bite, as the saying goes. Um, but uh, you can see that that's going to shift things up a little bit, but not uh, dramatically, I don't think. So uh, 
what does this actually mean in terms of uh, possible supersymmetric particle masses? For, instance, for example, the Gluino mass or the, the uh, dark matter particle mass. So uh, this is the result of our fit for the Gluino mass. And uh, bizarrely, we actually find a, a couple of relatively favored uh, regions. I, I emphasize again, this isn't the simplest possible model. And uh, one of these regions, the region on the left, I think, uh, has every chances of being explored with the uh, upgrades of the LHC that uh, Lars mentioned. Uh, on the other hand, the region on the right, this would actually require a higher energy accelerator. And so if we still believe in supersymmetry uh, 10 years hence or so, then uh, maybe that will provide additional motivation for going to a very high energy LHC. Okay, so uh, there's certainly plenty of connections between uh, supersymmetry and uh, cosmology, uh, assuming that supersymmetry exists at all. Uh, and uh, one of them I've already mentioned is, is dark matter, and uh, Malcolm will be saying more about dark matter in a moment. Uh, I actually wanted to spend the rest of my talk talking about uh, connections between supersymmetry and cosmological inflation. So we'll be hearing a lot about this uh, later on in the meeting. Uh, so I don't need to tell you that uh, the Planck CMB observations are nicely consistent with the generic idea of inflation. Uh, there's a tilted scalar spectrum, which is certainly redolent of you know, rolling down some potential towards eventually uh, zero. Uh, on the other hand, here again, there's a dog that did not bark. In this case, the dog that did not bark was tensor perturbations, which now have an upper limit of something like 10% of the uh, scalar perturbations. And uh, this is certainly a challenge for many simple inflationary models. So this is uh, taken from one of the Planck papers. So it shows you a whole bunch of uh, models with monomial single field scalar potentials, which uh, all fail to fit the data. Um, there is one model that does fit the data, which is the Starobinsky model. And I'll be you know, rabbiting on about that quite a lot in the coming minutes. Uh, not the only model that is consistent with the data. And actually, the simplest possible supersymmetric model uh, is also compatible with the data, as I'll discuss in a moment. So anyway, just to remind you about the Starobinsky model, so uh, he wrote down this uh, theory with an R-squared term in the uh, effective action. Uh, doesn't look like it has a scalar field. How do you do inflation? Uh, well, the answer is that uh, you can do a uh, conformal transformation. And uh, in that way, you recover a scalar field. And that scalar field has a potential, which when you calculate the uh, density perturbations, which was done first off by Mukhanov and uh, Chibisov a long, long time ago, then you get uh, a small value for the tensor to scalar ratio, uh, which is consistent, as I mentioned, with the Planck data. Now, uh, that's not the only model which is compatible with the Planck data. And uh, it was pointed out a few years ago by uh, Bezukhov and Shaposhnikov that you could also get very similar, basically identical predictions with the Higgs boson. And uh, this would be a, a wonderful theory. This would be truly uh, you know, Occam's razor, you know, you know rules OK. Uh, you put in a, a standard model give the Higgs boson a non-minimal coupling to gravity, uh, which is characterized by this parameter psi up here. Uh, you have to choose a, a rather large value of this non-minimal coupling. And when we talk about non-minimal, we're talking very non-minimal, OK? Uh, but anyway, then you do the calculation, and you get an effective potential, which looks very similar to the uh, Starobinsky model. Not quite the same, somewhat different, but very similar. And to get successful inflation, you need a very large value for this parameter psi up there. So uh, this is uh, showing you what's going on. So uh, you know, the stuff that Lars was talking about, the stuff that's been verified experimentally, uh, is you know, this little invisible bit down here. Okay? But the idea is that you run the theory up to high energies, and you get a potential which looks rather like that. And that then gives you this green prediction for the... Uh, inflationary observables, a value of the tilt, and a value of R, which I'll 
as I said, basically indistinguishable from the standard density model. Uh, there's just one small problem with this. And the small problem is that uh, you need that potential to be positive, right? And unfortunately, if you take the measurement of the Higgs mass that has been uh, done by uh, the LHC experiments and the value of the top quark mass, uh, as I discussed earlier on, actually the potential is not positive when you go to large field values. It's actually negative, that is the instability that I mentioned earlier on. Now I should say that this is not a definitive conclusion. Uh, in particular, uh, it depends on the precise value of the top quark mass. And uh, I emphasize to my experimental colleagues that it would be really, really, really nice to measure the top quark mass somewhat better than has been done so far to really pin down whether this you know, Occam's razor scenario is feasible or not. OK. Uh, so Higgs inflation you know, would be great, but to me it looks like no banana. So, so what else could you do with a simple uh, scalar field model? Well, models with a monomial potential don't work out, but you could, could of course, try a polynomial potential. And uh, this is an example of a potential which, which does just fine, got a double well, uh, gives you a, a better tensor to scalar ratio, uh, and uh, you get good inflation if you start off the field uh, in this region down here in between the uh, two wells of the potential. Okay, so you, you can do that, although at this stage it looks like a rather arbitrary model. Now, I, I was mentioning earlier supersymmetry. So I would actually argue that uh, inflation cries out for supersymmetry. In fact, we wrote a, a paper with precisely that title back in 1983. The point is that uh, these simple inflationary models involve what at least looks like an elementary scalar field. And in order to get the right magnitude of perturbations, you need either a mass which is much smaller than n Planck, so quote unquote unnaturally small, or you need a coupling which is very, very small. And both of these things look rather bizarre in a generic field theory. Uh, on the other hand, they would be technically natural in the framework of supersymmetry. So let's look at the simplest possible supersymmetric model, Wessemina model, written down in 1973. Uh, two parameters, uh, a single uh, complex scalar field. You know, this is the simplest possible supersymmetric theory you could imagine writing down. And you calculate the effective potential. And it turns out that this model gives you good inflation. Uh, it reduces to the polynomial, double well, single field model that I showed you a moment ago. And in that region of the parameter space here, you get good inflation compatible with the Planck data. So here again is the uh, Planck uh, constraint on the uh, tilt and the uh, tensor to scalar ratio. And uh, here's a bunch of models that don't do too well. And the Westermina model, at least for certain suitably chosen values of the parameters, you know, comes within this dark blue uh, Planck-friendly region. So uh, I'm not going to go through this in great detail. That was just a memory to say that you know, if there are parameters where this simplest possible supersymmetric model gives you successful inflation. But that's bullshit. You couldn't possibly take this seriously. Because, you know, if you're talking about early universe, you have to worry about gravity. You can't muck around with a globally supersymmetric theory. You have to do a locally supersymmetric theory. In other words, you have to do a supergravity theory. Well, th that's all well and fine, except that uh, theorists have been worrying for 30 years about the fact that a generic supergravity theory doesn't look like it's tailor-made for inflation. It tends to give you a potential with big bumps and dips in it. In fact, uh, generic supergravity theory even has holes in the potential with a value of minus n Planck to the fourth, which you know, would really you know, worry your grandmother about falling into it. However, that said, there, there is actually one exception. There's a class of theories called no-scale supergravity, which actually generic 
in compactifications of string theory, which give you a nice flat potential with at least some control over the uh, corrections to the inflationary potential. So uh, we sat down uh, back in uh, May and tried to figure out, well, could you actually construct a no-scale supergravity inflationary model which would be compatible with the Planck data? So uh, we looked at the simplest possible example, estimating a superpotential, um, and hey presto, we found good inflation. So I, I don't think that for this audience I'm going to go through the details. I can assure you there are details. You could perhaps <laughs> imagine that <laughs> in the context of supergravity there are going to be details. Um, but anyway, the uh, thing works, and we got an effective potential which looks like this. So these various different colors correspond to different values of the parameters. And there's a, a black one here, which gives you a nice flat potential. The other ones, well, they're almost as flat, but not quite as flat, and they go up and they go down and so on and so forth. So we were sort of looking at this, and uh, my collaborator, Keith Solich, said, holy shit, or worse to that effect. He said, this black one looks kind of like the Starobinsky model. And indeed, it is the Starobinsky model. So uh, this, again, is the Starobinsky model. And I told you, you make a conformal transformation. You get an effective potential, which has a, an asymptotic constant with an approach which is exponentially suppressed. And that actually is identical with this no-scale supergravity model, uh, at least for one particular choice of the parameters. So I don't know whether there is some profound connection between uh, higher derivative uh, gravity and uh, no-scale supergravity. I mean, we've written a couple of papers on this, and there certainly do seem to be some you know, reasons for thinking there is some connection, although I don't think that we really put our finger on the, the deep uh, connection that must surely exist. So coming back yet again to the uh, Planck measurements, uh, this is actually uh, showing in detail what this type of inflation model predicts. So, uh, so horizontal axis again for tilt, vertical axis the tensor to a scalar ratio. This is a blow up of the region of interest. And uh, the thing which is interesting about this model is that actually it doesn't I mean, the black thing, that actually is Starobinsky. But the, it gives you other models, which you know, could give you, you know, a slightly different value of the uh, tilt, slightly different value, uh, maybe, of the, uh, of the uh, tensor to scalar ratio. So it's actually something where you could you know, sort of parameterize a space around Starobinsky, and then you could use experiment to distinguish what's uh, going on. So it looks like the R-square model, but also allows possibilities for uh, deviations. And uh, I've been very glad to hear that there is, I mean, people were talking about long-term future in particle physics. Long-term future in uh, CMB physics might be the uh, somewhat unfortunately named PRISM project. <laughs> uh, but this would have sensitivity to the tensor to scalar ratio, which should get you, you know, down below this prediction of Starobinsky et al. So there's quite a lot of theoretical activity in this area, and I just list here some of the recent papers on this subject. In particular, uh, it was taken up shortly after our paper by uh, uh, Jan Aguida, collaborators, uh, Kalosh, Linda, and a whole bunch of uh, other people. Uh, so in fact, there, there are generalizations of this model, uh, a lot of generalizations. Uh, which, again, I'm not going to go through in, uh, in great detail. Um, let me just show you this, which is... Uh, uh, well, actually, maybe just focus on the picture on the right. The picture on the right is sort of interesting. It looks rather like this canyon that they just discovered underneath the Greenland ice sheet. Uh, but actually, this shows you that you can construct a complete model where you get good inflation, uh, that... Starobinsky model corresponds to coming out along this valley and coming down to the bottom here. Uh, but the other degrees of freedom that you have in the model are stabilized and uh, 
everything is uh, tickety-boo. So I, I said that in this uh, type of theory, you can construct uh, extensions or, or generalizations of the Starobinsky model. And uh, this is something that uh, Dr. Nata Kalosh and Andrew Linder have also uh, looked at. Uh, you can consider a general set of models where you have a, an asymptotically constant potential which is uh, approached uh, exponentially. And then you can calculate uh, the traditional CMB observables in terms of these uh, parameters. And uh, so you could imagine doing some sort of phenomenology of this. Um, and in fact, in the sort of no-scale supergravity models that we're discussing, uh, there's actually a, a quite uh, generic alternative prediction, which would be somewhat different from Starobinsky, uh, which would actually give you a somewhat lower value of the uh, tensor to scalar ratio. So uh, CMB might actually be a way of doing the phenomenology of string compactifications. I don't know if there's any string theorists here. But anyway. So that brings me to the end of what I wanted to say. Uh, the discovery of uh, the, or at least a, Higgs boson at the LHC has made scalar particles finally experimentally respectable. But I would argue that for these things to be theoretically respectable, you need supersymmetry. And of course, if you've got one scalar particle, you may have a whole lot more. In particular, you might have the inflaton. Uh, of course, the Higgs boson might still be the inflaton, although, as I said, this looks a little bit unlikely. Uh, in fact, I would argue that inflation cries out for supersymmetry, and you can certainly make supersymmetric models that are compatible with Planck et al., and many of those models actually give something which looks very much like the St Starobinsky model, and by probing, e.g. with PRISM, you might get a window on string compactification. Thank you. Questions? I mean, the connection to fundamental inflationary theory are all based on measurement of NS and R, which are two numbers. And of course, we can expand any inflationary in slow roll parameters, and a large number, I don't even know what the number is, can cover quite a range of um, slow roll space. So how would you know, even if, even if Prism were to find an R of whatever, 10 minus 3 and an NS of 0.97, that this, in fact, does connect to a specific theory as opposed to any other of, you know, large number of theories which can hit that same parameter space? Yeah. Well, well of course, you can never prove that a theory is right because there's so many theories. That can, okay. uh, what you can do is prove that a theory is wrong. So uh, I mean, the Starobinsky model makes very precise predictions as to what NS and R should be, and this can be you know, disproven, but it should certainly be something useful to do. And uh, as I mentioned, the other models, the generalizations that, 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 that I discussed, these can also be disproved. Uh, so you gave us a sense of Starobinsky-like models and supersymmetry and so on. Is there enough structure in these models that would tell us what the couplings would be to some model fields and so on? So you could do the heating and something like that in these models? So uh, the Starobinsky model per se, no, it doesn't say anything about that. Uh, the sort of uh, class of models that I discussed, yes, then you could start you know, doing some more specific phenomenology and perhaps this would have been a better answer to your question because then you can relate to it to other observables. And uh, the precise way in which, in our model, the supergravity degrees of freedom are connected to the standard model degrees of freedom would affect things like, for example, the reheating temperature, which would in turn uh, play back into the precise prediction for NS, right, which, as you know, is sensitive to the uh, amount of e-folds that you have. So, so that is something which we're working on at the moment. Baryogenesis requires physics beyond the standard model, and I guess one of the numbers we've measured with precision in cosmology that particle physicists haven't used yet is the baryon photon ratio. The fact that you need to have new physics, what does that mean for things like the stability of the vacuum? I mean, there's got to be something there um, beyond what we see, beyond the, the single Higgs. Right. 
So, so, so I would argue that in a generic supersymmetric theory, you, you stabilize the vacuum. Okay. Right. Uh, when you go to a generic uh, supergravity theory, uh, the problem comes back in spades. But no scale supergravity at least provides you know, a palliative for, for that problem. So, so that, that, that's you know, part of the whole sort of uh, background of why I'm heading off in this direction. Now, with regard to the point about uh, baryogenesis, uh, it, amusingly, in this scenario, the field that drives inflation could actually be responsible for baryogenesis. And that would actually be the simplest example of sort of connecting to, uh, to reality, so to speak. And uh, so that scalar field that I had, complex scalar field, could actually be the supersymmetric partner of a neutrino, which, when it decays, could then give you baryogenesis. And so you get, you know, single, everything done in one package. Which at least would have the merit that it could be disproved. Um, thank you very much for a wonderful talk. Um, can I just ask, you know, for people outside of particle physics, it's, it's a perfect example of we're always struck by the contrast between the theoreticians who have, you know, such a strong motiva motivation for su supersymmetry, you know, all of the arguments you presented are, are very convincing, and yet at the same time, we always have the experimentalists talking about how they can't see a shred of evidence, and again and again, we hear <laughs> these talks here. Um, I mean, given that it took that long, uh, that long for the Higgs, I mean, I suppose one, 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 one must have to have to sort of contemplate the idea that the first, I like the word yet, but let's, say, let's imagine that the first supersymmetric particle turns out to be extremely difficult to find. And this comes back to the first question. I mean, it seems to me that every, anything that comes out of the CMB will be, you know, um, let's shall we say, not incompatible with rather than direct evidence. That the problem is, you know, how does how does one what happens if it, it if if it, it takes an extremely long time to, to to find a particle at the LHC? Yeah, so so let me just uh, uh, retaliate with a little bit of history. So as I said, the Higgs boson was postulated in 1964 and was discovered in uh, 2012, 48 years. So supersymmetry was postulated in 1973. But come on, guys, it's only 40 years since supersymmetry was. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, give the LHC, you know, eight years to look for supersymmetry, and if it doesn't find it within that period, then I'll be retired. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one last uh, question. But, but, but seriously, though, folks, I mean, in addition to the LHC, we've got the dark matter searches, and I guess that you know, Malcolm will talk to you about that. And those are going to certainly be improving in the coming eight years, too. Cliff? This is just a comment. I, I like very much the... Exponent, uh, the emphasis on the exponential potentials as opposed to the curvature squared models. And I just wanted to comment that there's a motivation for the, having those kind of no-scale models uh, coming out of uh, string inflation. The five or six years ago, fiber inflation kind of models tended to give you that kind of a, generically give you that kind of a, a structure when the inflaton was a modulus. It kind of, there's a general argument why you're getting exponentials in the potential if, right, if, right. It's, a, if it's a modulus. Right, right. So, so so in our framework, th this field could actually be a modulus, or it could be a matter field which is sort of linked together with a modulus in some sort of no-scale structure. Uh, so I, I think this is a very interesting region of theory space to explore. Okay, so before we thank uh, John again, um, I just have two quick announcements. The first one is that if you haven't signed up for the banquet yet, it's not late, so you can go to the reception and get a ticket for that. Also, if you want to go to the public lecture and don't have a ticket, you can get still get that. Um, and then finally, if you're giving a talk in a parallel session today, it's important that we get your talks, um, and slides in particular. So please go upstairs to the, to the reception desk. There will be USB sticks. It's a two-step process. The first step is you find the number, the session number, the three sessions this afternoon, and then you put your talk on a stick labeled one, two, or three, depending on which number session you're in. So, and we're going to be upstairs to help with that process. Okay, thank you very much, and thanks to John again for a nice day. Okay, so. Let's get started for the next session. Um, there are a couple more seats in the middle, in fact, if you want to have a more central view of the show, so you can also 
next time when you come, move inside. Um, okay, so the next speaker is a, is a real life hero. Um, in fact, we had a very late cancellation yesterday and you know, very late in the evening, I, um, Malcolm kindly agreed to pre prepare a talk for this morning. And so I'm very grateful that he, he's filling in and he's gonna talk about dark matter. Okay, I haven't had much sleep, all right? I don't really know where I am, okay? Yeah. So, reminder, why we think dark matter... I'm not Stefano Profumo. He's a lot better looking than I am. If you wanted to see Stefano, feel free to leave now. I will not be offended, okay? But his flight got cancelled, so... I'm going to talk about why we think dark matter exists, indirect detection of dark matter, direct detection of WIMPs, some particle models of WIMPs which are still healthy in September 2013. Evidence for dark matter, I don't need to go over this with you guys. It, well, I will. The universe is expanding, but we know from nuclear synthesis that only 4% of the universe can be baryons. What's all the rest? If you look at the CMB, the chi-squared gets worse by something ridiculous, more than 200 if you don't include dark matter, which makes the plasma heavier, changes the oscillations. As long ago as 1933, Fritz Wicke realized there was a problem with the virial theorem, that the coma cluster, the galaxies are moving too quickly. They've got things like the bullet cluster, which you can't explain the gravitational lensing unless you've got dark matter. Well, some people claim they can, but. And of course, we've got spiral galaxies. If you look out in the outer parts of spiral galaxies, they're rotating a lot faster than th they should do. So that's, everybody, all these things point to there being some invisible mass that we can't see. Lensing also suggests the presence of dark matter. So. WIMPs work, so WIMPs are particles which are, there's as many, they're either WIMPs are their own antiparticles or there's as many WIMPs as anti-WIMPs. And they're in thermal equilibrium in the early universe and their self-annihilation cross-section is roughly given by the electroweak scale. And if that's the case, then you run time forwards and when they go out of equilibrium, you end up miraculously with roughly the right amount of density to explain the amount of dark matter that we require in the universe. <clears throat> For a wide range of masses. And this means that we sort of know what the WIMP self-annihilation cross-section has to be, because in order to end up with the right relic abundance, we know what the self-annihilation cross-section has to be. And that leads us straight into WIMP indirect detection, because if they were annihilating in the early universe, they'll be annihilating today, and got, we can try and see the signals of those annihilations. So dark matter self-annihilation, you get dark matter particles, WIMPs come in, they annihilate with themselves, and then they produce standard model particles, and we want to see the single signals of those standard model particles. The rate at which dark matter annihilates with itself is given by, we think we know this self-annihilation cross-section. We've got some prejudices and ideas about the mass of the dark matter particles, and in particular, if they are WIMPs, they have to be roughly of the order of, you know, GeV to 1,000 GeV or something. But the question is, how well do we know the density? Because the density determines, the density squared obviously determines how often these things hit themselves. And in particular, we expect the density to be greatest at the galactic center or the center of galaxies. So this is a, a dark matter simulation, the Aquarius simulation. This is logarithm of rho times r squared. And you can see that basically it's fitted well by a functional form like this, which is called the Inasto profile, which suggests that the dark matter in the center of galaxies is a lot more dense than it is in the outer parts of galaxies. So in principle, you would want to look in the center of galaxies to see how much dark matter, to see the d dark matter annihilating with itself and producing a signal. Now, the typical slope, so if we say that the, the d we say this thing gamma is minus d log rho by d log r, it tells us how steeply the dark matter goes down from the center. As we move away from r equals zero, how steeply does the dark matter density go down? And we think, when you include things like baryonic contraction, that you expect a gamma somewhere between 1 and 1.7. Um, now, this is the luminosity that we expect from the center of the galaxy in ergs per second. An ergs about a quarter of a TeV. That's the solar luminosity there, right? So, and this here, shrunk, is on the same scale. This is the actual astrophysical stuff that we can see from the center of the universe on the same scale, center of the galaxy. I told you I haven't got much sleep. It's going to happen again. <laughs> center of the galaxy. Um, on the same scale. And you can see that the astrophysical background that we expect is very similar to the amount of luminosity we expect from the self-annihilation of dark matter, which is quite a heavy coincidence because the origin for these two luminosities is completely different, right? <clears throat> 
So here's Fermi's view of the galactic center. That's north. So you can see, you know, there are some gamma rays concentrated on the galactic center. But being a gamma ray telescope is a bit like being a short-sighted man in a dark room. There are not many gamma rays, and you don't have a very good resolution. There's lots of other stuff down there as well. So there was this interesting paper, which uh, so has Fermi detected dark matter annihilation at the galactic center. So what you can do is you can separate this gamma ray flux from the galactic center into annuli moving outwards from the galactic center. And then you can model the gamma rays that you expect from astrophysical sources, so from the bulge and from the disk, and then you get the total. And this, this, these, people, these authors, uh, Hooper and people, have suggested that you get an excess of gamma rays in the inner, in the central section. There are too many gamma rays coming from the central section, more than you expect from the background gamma rays. And you don't see that in the outer parts, OK? So they claim that this could be evidence of dark matter annihilating with itself. But this is very far from being universally agreed or taken seriously, right? It's just a very interesting thing. So this is the spectrum that they see as we go up in energy here. These are the, these are the photons that they see that they think might come from dark matter. But for example, there's an alternative explanation here by these people and, and Chernyakova et al. So they just suggest that these are high energy protons that are accelerated by the supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy. And the diffusion coefficient is such that the high, energy, the high energy protons manage to stream away from that region without any difficulty, producing a nice power law that's observed at high energies. But the lower energy protons get buffeted around by turbulence in the magnetic fields, and they end up concentrated in the central region, and consequently you get this different shape of spectrum there. And they can fit the same data using these protons banging around and producing gamma rays in this way. So, there's a nice little bit of evidence there, and we need to understand the astrophysics more to understand exactly what's going on. Then there's this, uh, this uh, looking for lines business. So Fermi can also look for spectral lines. So if you like, a smoking gun signature of dark matter is you get two dark matter particles coming in and annihilating, and every so often they will go into two photons, okay? And then the photons, of course, will carry away the rest mass of the dark matter, so you should get a monochromatic line. Not mo usually, most of the photons come from secondary processes, so you get a spectrum, but you can get a monochromatic line. So this is an analysis done by Veniger, and what he's done is he's analyzed the Fermi data, and he's, he's for different kinds of density profile, and for each choice of density profile, he's chosen only those pixels that together will maximize the overall signal-to-noise ratio. And then he's looked for lines. So, and he's seen this line by looking at the center of the galaxy, which corresponds to about 130 GeV. And it's reasonably statistical signif statistically significant. The statistical significance depends on which density profile you look at. So this has caused, a, a, this caused an enormous amount of interest. Um, but now, it's not quite clear exactly what's going on, because recently Fermi have looked at the same thing in more detail. They tend to do things very thoroughly and take a long time to do them, as which I suppose is a very good thing. And um, they've, they've seen a bump in the energy response of Fermi in a similar energy, even when they're looking at the Earth limb. And consequently, it's clear that a lot more work needs to be done to understand the, the response of the instrument and also understand exactly what's going on to see if these Fermi lines can be taken seriously. There's this other issue, which is, comes from a completely different direction, which is related to um, direct detection, uh, sorry, indirect detection which is that we don't really know how much dark matter there is at the center of the galaxy. And people who do simulations of galaxies are putting baryons into their simulations, and they're finding all sorts of strange things happening. Well, uh, previously, it was thought that baryons would shrink into the center of the galaxy by losing energy and emitting radiation and shrink into the middle and form a big potential well, which would actually bring in the dark matter and make it, a deep, uh, make it even steeper at the center. However, they're, they're doing things with gastrophysics, so they're having supernova explosions go off in their simulations, which redistributes the baryons and pushes them out. So you get the dark matter adiabatically being contracted and then non-adiabatically being shot, so the gravitational potential well is doing all sorts of things. And the result seems to be that sometimes you don't end up with such a steep amount of dark matter at the center of the galaxy as you might like. So here's a bunch of simulations. This is the mass of the, the galaxy. Um, in solar masses, and this is some, something that comes from CDM. So here's some simulations 
This is alpha at 500 parsecs from the center of the galaxy. So alpha is how steeply the, the density is going up as you approach the center of the galaxy. <clears throat> and of course, if alpha is going up more steeply, you're going to have a bigger signal. Um, so if it's more negative, you're going to have a bigger signal from indirect detection. So if you do, I only have dark matter in your simulations, you get uh, values like this. But if you include baryons in your simulations, it seems to flatten out the dark matter in the inner parts of the galaxies. And that might be a big problem for people who are hoping to do indirect detection. So I just wanted to throw that in there, not to you know, be too pessimistic, but anyway. So dwarf seroidal galaxies are very interesting objects. So you're looking at the center of the galaxy. If you're looking at the middle of the Milky Way, there's an enormous amount of stuff down there, and it's very difficult to separate the signal from the astrophysics. But if you take a dwarf seroidal galaxy, you don't really have the same problem because they've got a very big mass to light ratio, which means there aren't many stars in there. There's a lot of dark matter. So in principle, any signal from the annihilation of dark matter shouldn't be hampered by there being lots of background from astrophysics. Okay, But they're very small, and they're they're reasonably quite far away from us. So they're, they're in orbit around the Milky Way, so they're not that far from us, but they're quite dim. So in practical terms, they're quite far from us. Now, these guys can tell us lots of different things. Not only can they tell us, if we understand the inner density profile of the dark matter in dwarf seroidals, how quickly that density goes up, not only will they tell us the expected annihilation signal from WIMPs, they could also tell us things like, is dark matter self-interacting? Or is dark matter warm or hot? Because if dark matter is self-interacting or warm, it's very difficult for the dark matter to concentrate really at the center. If it's got lots of kinetic energy, it will redistribute itself. And if it's colliding with itself, the pressure will redistribute itself, a bit like a star. You know? The thing is, so you can do lots, in, pr in principle, you can do lots of sexy new physics with dwarf seroidals if you can figure out what the density is as a function of radius. However, you've got the same boring health warning, and that is that gastrophysical effects can also change the density of dark matter in dwarf seroidals. So that's start baryons falling into the middle and then go, going off as supernovae and what have you, and redistributing the dark matter. But anyway, here's the most obvious thing that you can do with dwarf seroidals. You can work out how many gamma rays you expect from the dark matter annihilating with itself. So here's some fits to the data. So these, these, this, this relies on you understanding how much dark matter there is in the dwarf seroidal. Then you integrate the rho squared times sigma v to get the number of gamma rays that you're going to get. And you can see that this is, 10 to the, uh, this is 3 times 10 to the minus 26 centimeters cubed per second. So this is what you need for WIMPs annihilating themselves. And you can see if you stack up all these dwarf seroidals that are going around the Milky Way, we're getting below that line for low mass WIMPs. Okay, So that's really interesting. Um, so we're not seeing gamma rays when we should see gamma rays. Now, there's a caveat here, and that is we don't know exactly what the density profiles of these dark matter, uh, the dark matter in these dwarf seroidals are. But that shouldn't introduce a massive uncertainty. But nevertheless, it's important to understand it. And again, baryonic effects might be important. So the, dark, the baryons, first of all, sink into the middle, and they pull the unsuspecting dark matter in. And then they go supernova, and the potential disappears, and the dark matter, which is very light, flies off. So, it's a bit messy. So there's quite a lot of people who, well, I'm talking about it because I'm one of the people, who's trying to understand how, how, you work out how, how you work out how much dark matter there is in dwarf seroidals. And the way that you do that is you use the genes equation and then you use the line of sight stellar dispersion. So we need to obtain M of R, okay, but we, can't, we don't know what the, so this is um, the genes equation. So sigma t is the velocity dispersion of stars um, you've got some velocity dispersion, which is like pro approximately a Gaussian, and you've got one which is perpendicular to the radial vector, and you've got one which is parallel to the radial vector, sigma r. So this beta is the anisotropy parameter. And we don't know what this is. We only see a project, even for stars, when we can see the stars, we don't know what it is, because this is radial, and we only see a projection of this. So we have to marginalize over this. So this, these are scenes from the spherical triaxial working group at the Gaia Challenge two weeks ago in the University of Surrey. This is Walter Danen giving me a dirty look for taking a photo of him. And that, this bunch of people all got together to see if, if we could understand what the density of dark matter was in some simulated dwarf seroidal galaxies. And we've all got different techniques, and some of them are more complicated than others. So our technique, which I'm just going to plug very quickly, is a new method to constrain the density of dwarf seroidals. Is, as well as using the second order in the velocity dispersion, we're also using the fourth order. And, um, the green is the way that we recover the red line, which is the underlying fake data. So we create a fake dwarf seroidal 
and we produce some stars that are moving around in this fake potential well, and we try to understand how quickly we can, re how well we can reproduce the potential well they're flying around in. And you see the blue lines is when you don't use the only, second, only the second order information, but if you include higher orders of the genes equation, in other words, if you take into account the kurtosis of the velocity dispersion, you can get more information. Now, so this is an example which worked really, really well, okay? But don't worry, they don't all work really, really well. So if you only do the second order, now the red, the dotted line is d log m by d log r. So that's the way that the mass goes down as a function of radius. It tells you whether you're chord or cusp. So this is a chord one. And you want to find out if this is a chord or a cusp dwarf toroidal. If you only use the second order information, you get this. But if you use the fourth order information, you get a much better reconstruction of the density. Now this one works well, but it doesn't always work so well yet. So me and Tom Richardson are working on that, and he's giving a little talk on this in the Galaxy session later in the week. So that's an active, dwarf seroidals are really important laboratories for dark matter physics, and, and trying to understand what the density in dwarf seroidals is, is a sort of sub-subject that quite a few people are engaged in. So positrons, moving on, okay. Pamela and AMS both see positrons. So these are both things that are in orbit around the Earth, and they see anti-electrons, more anti-electrons than you would expect. These, no, you do expect to see positrons, so you get cosmic rays coming in, high energy cosmic rays coming in, they hit the galaxy, and then you get cascades, and as part of those cascades, you get positrons created. Now the thing is that you expect those cascades to give you a nice spectrum that keeps on going down all the way there. Now, what Pamela noticed, the blue data points, was that actually you were getting a lot more positrons than you expected as a fraction of the total number of electrons and positrons. It was going up. So everyone was very excited about this, but it wasn't really clear that this very small collaboration, this very small box, which was attached to the side of, size of a Russian weather satellite and only had one way of discriminating things, people didn't really know if they should trust it. But then AMS, which has been called LHC in space, it's a massive, great, wonderful detector which has been bolted to the International Space Station, has shown that the Pamela people got it spot on. And now AMS are picking up the, you know, they're taking the next leg of the relay and they're trying to go to higher energies and reduce the errors. So these positrons, where do they come from? Are they a signal of dark matter? Well, they could be a signal of dark matter. It could be dark matter annihilating with itself because if it annihilates, it'll produce as much matter as antimatter. So people have shown that you can model these uh, positrons by the annihilation of dark matter. The trouble is that there are so many positrons that if we just take that cross-section that I was talking about, it seems impossible to get as many positrons as is necessary to explain the signal from AMS. So this is, this is the, what, you, what you call the boost factor. So if you've got a problem where you need more annihilations than what you've got, which is what we've got with the positrons, you can do things like this. So we know the freeze out the self-annihilation cross-section in the early universe, you can come up with some reason why the self-annihilation cross-section today is a lot bigger, which would result in a lot more self-annihilation. And we know that the average density is not the relevant thing for self-annihilation. It's the average density squared. So if you say that there's actually quite a lot of local substructure, so lots of like little clusters of dark matter, then you have to take the average of the, the density squared. And that could be quite different from the average of the density squared. So... Um, but however, people have done simulations and they've shown that deep, we're quite deep sort of down in the middle of the Milky Way. In, the Milky Way, as far as dark matter is concerned, is a big, massive thing. And down here, we're right in the middle of a potential well. And any of this substructure that's made it down here should have been tidally disrupted. And we know that positrons don't get very far because they lose energy fairly quickly. So the positrons that we're seeing have to have been created within about a kiloparsec of the sun. Okay, so that doesn't seem to be a viable thing. So one of the ways that people, so you can think of different ways to make the cross-section different today as to what it was in the early universe. If you've got S-channel ionizations, you've got a problem because the cross-section in the early universe should be the same as the cross-section today. If you've got P-channel annihilations, it can go the wrong way. So we need something else to enhance the cross-section. Now, if we had dark matter that was very heavy, then in principle, you would get dark matter particles pulled together kind of semi-classically by the exchange of W and Z bosons to enhance the annihilation cross-section. So some people took this idea, this is called Sommerfeld enhancement, they took this idea and they ran with it. And in general, you can consider a much lighter, so this is a dark 
force in between dark particles. Okay? Some, a much lighter GeV boson, for example, weakly coupled. And that would make the dark matter sort of classically attract itself, so you would enhance the self-annihilation cross-section. Now, some people have said that that's a problem, because in the early universe, when the dark matter is really moving very, very slowly, you're going to get a lot of self-annihilation, because this happens at very, very low velocities. So in the early universe, the dark matter was very, not, very, not moving very quickly, because its motion mainly comes about through it falling in, into potential wells, because it's cold dark matter. So in the early universe, it, it, when it is moving very slowly, you would think uh, you'd have problems for the first structures that are formed. So for example, I refer to this work by Kamiokowski and Profumo. So Profumo's the poor guy whose flight got canceled. I tell you, he's good looking, isn't he? <laughs> so that's one way that you can possibly boost the self-annihilation cross-section to get nice positrons that could fit the AMS signal. The other possible way that you can get it is just astrophysical origins of electrons and positrons. So these are super, this is supernova remnant, a pulsar flying around. It could produce antimatter, and that could come to us. Now, AMS, of course, now they've, they're getting massive statistics, and they've only just started their job. So that's fantastic that we're going to get lots more data about this. Um, one of the things that they've tested is whether if the excess has got a particle physics origin, if it's coming from dark matter, it should come from all over the sky. If it's coming from a pulsar, you would expect it to come from the direction of the pulsar preferentially. Okay? At the moment, you can't tell, because at the moment, if you look at the dipole anisotropy, it's less than 3% at the 95% confidence level. However, our, our missing speaker, I, I feel sorry for it, uh, he... He, the 3% anisotropy is still larger than the anisotropy you expect for a single pulsar. So you're really going to have to measure this anisotropy very, very carefully if you're going to distinguish between a pulsar and, um, and dark matter. Okay, so indirect detection conclusions. We've got hints from the galactic center of low-mass WIMPs, but you know, they're just hints, but they're exciting. There's other astrophysical explanations exist. There's hints from the galactic center of gamma ray delta functions, but we, we, need, we need to understand this better. Understanding the density profile of dwarf seroidals is important for a variety of different reasons. Uh, the anomalous positron and electron flux might be a signal, might not be a signal. But there's lots of work being done, and we're going to get updates on all these things over the next couple of years. Just a quick aside, self-interacting dark matter, the motivations are, if you've got these theories of Sommerfeld enhancement, then you've got this idea that you've got a dark sector with bosons flying around, so you've got some dark forces. Then you've got this missing satellites problem. In, CD, in lambda CDM simulations, you get lots of little dwarf seroidals, and we don't see anywhere near as many dwarf seroidals in reality as what you see in simulations. Then you've got the core versus cusp problem, dwarf seroidal Galaxies seem to have the density goes to a constant density as you approach the core as opposed to keeping on going up as you would expect in a cold dark matter simulation. And then you've got this too big to fail problem. The biggest dwarf steroidal we observe is not, as, is not as big as you get in simulations. Now, two and three can potentially be solved with this baryonic gastrophysics that I was talking about. Four might be solved with baryons and a bad estimate for the Milky Way mass. One could just be playing wrong. However, you know, we can test it, so let's just assume that you know, all these things are things that we should worry about and test the self-interaction of dark matter. So it's not as simple as it appears to be. So for a potential, like a Yukawa potential like that, you expect the perturbative cross-section, which is easy to work with. You can write it down and then you can stick it into your simulation. However, it's been shown that if you want to do it for real astrophysical systems, things get non-perturbative. And you need to use these different expressions. So you really have to do computer simulations of particles moving around in each other's potentials and whizzing around three times before they zoom off. And then you have to fit it all numerically. And then you have to try and somehow stick that or attach it to your simulations in some way that allows you to take in all this stuff into account and figure out if there is self-interaction of dark matter. So besides these difficulties, people are trying to constrain such models using objects such as the bullet cluster, which you've heard the dark matter is flying through itself. So if it's self-interacted, you get a constraint. So I won't talk about that. But also this guy, the elliptical galaxy NGC 720, which they've managed to say that the dark matter itself, the dark matter halo, is triaxial. So it's not spherical. And that allows you to put a constraint on it. Because if it was bashing into itself, then it would end up being spherical. 
Typical constraints from both this and the bullet cluster give you something which is about a centimeter squared per gram. It's about 10 to the 12 times the weak interaction. It's quite a big cross section in terms of the particle physics which is going on in the standard model sector. So, but this is, this is a, a so I just wanted to mention this because quite a lot of people are interested in it at the moment. Moving on, direct detection of dark matter. Every so often, a dark matter particle will hit you. And when it hits you, you know, we think in every cubic meter, there's about 1,000 dark matter particles. They're all moving about 200 kilometers per second. When they hit you, they leave a bit of energy, like a, a KEV worth, an X-ray worth of energy, you know? And people are trying to look for these energy. And, you know, it can produce, uh, if you've got a cryogenic system, it can heat up the cryogenic system. People look for the temperature change. It can produce, if you've got a scintillating system, it can give you a, a photon. People look for the photons. It can give you ionization. There's lots of different ways to look for this. Of course, the backgrounds are awful, but people are brave, and they do it, you know? So if you want to know the counts per kilogram per detector mass per keV, for a, for a, you have to do this integral. So what you're doing here, I've stolen this from Thomas Schwetz. What you're doing here is um, in, the, in the rest frame of the galaxy, you've got a distribution of dark matter velocities. Okay, Let's say it's a Gaussian distribution in the rest frame of the galaxy. But we are moving around the galaxy at 200 kilometers per second. So let's say that I've got a detector which if I hit it such that I get a recoil of 3 keV, it'll make the detector go bing. Then I need to integrate over all the parts of the velocity distribution that are outside this purple line. But if my detector is less sensitive and I hit it, I need a recoil energy of 10 keV for it to go bing, then I need to integrate over this much smaller region out here. So that's the game. Different detectors have got different recoil energies. And if they're made from different atoms, you're going to get a different recoil energy when it gets bashed with the same velocity. So it's a bit of a complicated game. Here's the state of the art. Xenon 100 has got the, the tightest constraint on the cross-section for a dark matter particle hitting a nucleus. It's something times 10 to the minus 45 centimeters squared, about 55 GeV. But as you can see, up here, there's a lot of funny stuff going on. OK? So it's, right, OK. So CDMS, OK, has detected three events with a 5.4% probability. They claim they've got a 5.4% probability. Um, uh, and they interpret that as it being a signal at 8.6 GeV. So the 8.6 GeV dark matter particle. Now the trouble is with that is that Xenon 100, which is a bigger machine, it rules out this area. It says that you can't have a dark matter particle with that mass and that cross section, otherwise you would get signals there. So how do we know that astrophysics isn't responsible for these differences? So there's lots of spherical sources of astrophysical uncertainty. There's non-spherical sources of astrophysical uncertainty. If we just take the spherical sources of the, uh, astrophysical uncertainty, again, we're solving the genes equation, but now not for stars. We're doing it for dark matter. If you fit things like the rotation of the galactic disk, the local rotation, its derivative, and the motion of distant blue stars, and the motion of the Milky Way satellites, and then you stick it all into an MCMC, you get a prediction for the local density, which is quite rigid. Now, the funny thing is, we don't know how much dark matter there is at the center of the galaxy, and we don't know how much dark matter there is in the outer parts of the galaxy, but it turns out we're living in a kind of sweet spot, 8.5 kiloparsecs from the center of the galaxy, where you do have a very, very good knowledge of the amount of dark matter that's around us. It's about 0.3 GeV per centimeter cubed. And we've also got a fairly good understanding of the velocity, the escape velocity of the galaxy, okay? It's somewhere around 560 kilometers per second. So what you do is you can crank the handle and you can work out what that means. What do we expect for the velocity distribution in the region close to the sun? And you, can, and you find that we expect something like this. And you take all these things into account. You include non-Gaussianity, the possibility that the distribution of dark matter is non-Gaussian, which ex you expect it to be non-Gaussian because it's not an ideal gas. And the variation due to all these effects is not that huge, actually. It's maybe an order of magnitude over here. But as you get to very, very small masses, the variation becomes massive. So this is the region here. The left-hand wall of this sensitivity where xenon rules out CDMS is, exact, is very, very sensitive to the escape velocity. So perhaps if we've got the escape velocity wrong, you might tell yourself. You could move the xenon in that direction, and CDMS wouldn't move as quickly in that direction. And we could explain the two signals together. Because for low-mass WIMPs, if you want to make a, a, a detector go bing, 
you have to hit it very, very hard to get the same recoil energy so that you've got enough recoil energy for the detector to be sensitive to it. So that's why it's sensitive to the escape velocity. However, it doesn't necessarily help reconcile, for example, CDMS and Xenon 100. Now, this is schematic. If I set the escape velocity to 450, then the, the fit, some measure of how good a fit it is, is 0.7. But if I change it to 650, the fit doesn't get any better. So the thing is that if you start messing with the escape velocity, not only do you, you shift the CDMS region to the left, but also you make the Xenon a better detector. So the things, generally speaking, if you want to explain CDMS and Xenon together, you have to do some funny stuff. So these astrophysical issues affect different experiments in different ways. Spherical uncertainties are much worse at low masses. In order to really convince ourselves that we've got a signal as well, we would need significant detection of multiple detectors. To, to one, get a signal in the, what we believed in the first place, and two, to measure the mass. I just wanted to put an advert in here that the, the UK dark matter community are trying to, they're, they're putting in a bid to join Lux Zeppelin. And if you look at the sensitivity of Lux Zeppelin, it's going to go down to 10 to the minus 48 centimeters squared. So over the next few years, things are going to change fairly rapidly. It's got two minutes, OK. I, I did put a lot in my talk. It was late. Right. Some particle models of WIMPs, which are still healthy in September 2013. So we've heard that the constrained minimal supersymmetric standard model, which has got neutralinos in it, is under pressure. So this is the evolution of time in the CMSSM. What you want to see here is blue parts, because dark blue is a good chi-squared. And as you become progressively green and more yellow, you've got a bad chi-squared. And as we post LHC and Xenon 100 in 2011, you see the colors getting worse. Post the discovery of, of the Higgs, they're getting worse again. And then Xenon, up, updated uh, limits from LHC and Xenon, they're getting even worse. And if you look at the direct detection, pre-LHC 2008, there was lots of nice blue regions. Post-discovery, you've got, you've got constraints from the Higgs, and you've also got constraints from Xenon 100, which has ruled out a lot of this parameter space. But CM, so the CMSSM is under pressure, but is that because it's too CM and not enough SSM, right? Is it too constrained and too minimal? So some people are just allowing things to be less constrained. So this is the PM SSM, where you allow all these different parameters to vary. And you can still get some nice regions. So one of the things that they look at is how fine-tuned the, the theory is. And... Um, you can get both low mass dark matter particles, which could in principle be consistent with CDMS. And in general, you can, you, haven't, you can still get some dark matter particles that haven't been ruled out by the existing limits, which is this Xenon 100. You've still got some good regions down here where you've got a cross section which you shouldn't have already been detected, which isn't too fine tuned. So there's also Higgs portal dark matter. I'm, I'm, I might do a talk in the parallel session this afternoon if I haven't collapsed on that. Um, but my conclusions are for particle candidates. As the LHC probes the electroweak scale, all WIMP models are facing tighter constraints as one would expect, OK? The simplest models of SUSY are under severe pressure, but it'll be some time before SUSY itself can be ruled out as the origin of dark matter. And many more, much simpler models are being studied in light of the new data, which will also face welcome pressure in the next few years from the LHC and direct detection experiments. So in conclusion, indirect, direct, and collider experiments are severely constraining the parameter space of WIMP models, and this is good. So thanks very much for listening. OK, questions? What is Dama Libra detected? Ah. <laughs> uh, uh. <laughs> so Dama is an experiment with a very, very uh, low energy threshold, uh, lower than most other experiments. It goes down to about 2 keV. And they've got very good statistical significance for an annual modulation, which um, so as the Earth goes around the sun, we're mo you're integrating over a different region of the, the background, okay, of, of the velocity distribution. And this, in principle, uh, can explain 
the, way, the fact that you've got, when we're moving most quickly into the wind wind, it's June the 2nd, and when we're moving least quickly into the wind wind, it's uh, December the 2nd. And this uh, annual modulation could, in principle, explain why Dharma is detecting dark matter, or potentially detecting dark matter. Um, they're only detecting dark matter in the lowest energy bin. So in principle, you could have a very light dark matter particle which was uh, um, giving you a signal, but it's very, very difficult to model it. Um, the way that I would try and model it is by putting a stream in. So if you imagine there's a stream coming from the same direction that the sun's moving in, um, and there are streams of galaxies moving, there are tidal streams with stars in them moving around the galaxy. If you had such a stream coming towards us and we were moving into it, then in principle, you might, and they were very light dark matter particles, but they had a huge velocity, something ridiculous, like a thousand kilometers per second. Then in principle, as we moved into it and came out of it, you could get a signal. If you don't do something like that, it's very difficult to understand how this can be explained without xenon going off, because they claim their low energy resolution is such that they would be able to see this. Um, so if you take xenon, and I mean, xenon wasn't designed to look at those low energies, but since it's become such an interesting area, they've spent a lot of time trying to understand their detector in this, right at this bottom energy range to see if these low mass dark matter particles are acceptable. And they claim that they can rule out Dharma. And um, so if you really take them seriously, then it, I have no idea what Dharma's detected. Yeah, it has detected an annual modulation. You're absolutely right. The statistics are very, very high. Whether that's dark matter or not, we don't know. Okay, maybe time for one quick question, if there's any. Or? No? Otherwise, let's, let's thank Malcolm, Malcolm again. <laughs> Okay, so our next speaker is Silvia Pascoli, who's going to tell us about neutrinos. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you about the only known component so far of uh, dark matter, which are neutrinos. And so as you know, neutrinos have seen in the past 15 years a large change in our understanding of the properties, because in 1998, we discovered at high significance, more than five sigma, the neutrino do oscillate. And this implies the neutrinos have mass and mix. Now, what has also happened in the meantime, that cosmology has become one of the main probes of neutrino masses, and I'm going to talk about that more later on. So, uh, first of all, I will discuss neutrinos from the particle physics point of view. I'll focus on the neutrino masses. So, starting from neutrino oscillations, I will look, uh, first of all, why that is so important from a theoretical perspective. I want to underline that determining uh, the neutrino masses, and in particular, if neutrinos are Majorana or Dirac particles, uh, as uh, some uh, um, uh, papers in cosmology have started looking at combining that with neutrino as double beta decay, has really very fundamental implications for how we understand particle physics, in particular, how we extend the standard model to explain neutrino masses. So I think we should not underestimate the impact that the cosmological observations, together with the particle physics searches, can have for our understanding of neutrino, I mean, neutrino, but more in general, uh, particle physics interactions and uh, a fundamental particles. So I'm going to look then at how we measure neutrino masses from the particle physics perspective. This is where I'm going to focus probably most of the time during this talk. And then I will compare that to what can be done in cosmology. Planck has already put very strong constraints, but there are even more exciting prospects for the future. And then I want to draw some uh, comparisons and looking at the complementarity between these searches. When we combine them together, we can actually draw quite strong statements out of it. 
So let me come with what uh, well, I'm sure you already know, uh, that the neutrinos do oscillate. Now the oscillation probability can be computed and that depends on the mixing angle uh, theta between, this is the disalignment between flavor states and massive states. Now flavor states are the states that interact according to the standard model. So this is the way I produce a neutrino. In an interaction I will produce a flavor neutrino. It could be an electron neutrino if uh, it is associated to an electron, a muon neutrino if it is associated to a muon, etc. And this is also the way I detect the neutrinos as flavor states. That they travel as massive states, and states which have a definite mass. The two bases are disaligned, uh, misaligned, so there is a mixing uh, which uh, relates the two. And like for example in any quantum mechanical system in which you produce a state which is not an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, this will lead to an oscillatory pattern for the probability of detection of the particle, spin precession for instance. This is exactly what happens here. So this is the mixing, this is a disalignment between the two bases, the flavor base and the massive base, and this is the mixing uh, the masses. Now because each mass state will evolve with a certain phase, now in order to uh, generate a different type of flavor state, you need the different phases uh, not to correspond, so for that one needs different masses. So this is the way neutrino oscillation imply that neutrinos mix, and from the perspective of the t this talk, neutrinos have mass, and this is really very very important because at least in the standard um, uh, standard model, uh, neutrinos don't have a mass and I'll comment on that in a couple of slides. So for me this is the first evidence that we have of physics beyond the standard model of particles. So this is the knowledge. The two parameters, the parameters which always control neutrino oscillations are mixing angle and the mass square differences. So this is the way uh, we analyze the data and we report the results. So there are two mass square differences, delta m square solar and delta m square atmospheric. As you see, they are very different. This is around 10.5, uh, 7.5, 10 to the minus 5 EV squared. And this is around 2.4, 10 to the minus 3 EV squared. So it's roughly a factor of 20 between the two. And then uh, there are various mm, uh, values for the mix mixing angles, this is the latest one which has been uh, uh, measured last year, but this is not really a focus of this talk. So let's think about in terms of masses. When we have two very different mass square differences, means that we need to have three neutrinos, three masses of neutrinos that we can arrange in two different ways. The normal ordering and the inverted ordering. So as you see here, the two lightest neutrinos are separated by the, the small mass square difference, uh, the solar one that I showed before, and we can express the three masses in terms of this minimal mass and uh, the mass square differences which are known. So already in the cosmology literature people talk about the normal hierarchical spectrum, what they mean is normal ordering plus negligible mass. So in this case you see that there is quite a difference between these masses and the biggest one is M3, which is given by the square root of delta M square atmospheric, which is around 0.05 electron volts. In the inverted ordering, the two heaviest masses are nearly degenerate, and in this case, because they are more or less given by the square root of delta M square atmospheric, this in the inverted hierarchical spectrum. So if you look now at the sum of the masses, now you have 0 0.05 here, 0 0.05 here, so 0.1 electron volt. So this is the prediction in the case of the inverted hierarchical spectrum. Notice also that this minimal mass in either case could be comparable to the delta M squares. So there is an interpolating regime between the case in which we can neglect the minimal mass and the case in which um, instead we can neglect the mass square differences, which is the quasi-degenerate spectrum. This is what current uh, cosmological observations and uh, also particle physics observations can actually test. So in order to determine the masses, which is what we um, really need from a theoretical point of view, we need to determine the ordering and we need to determine the absolute mass scale. Why is this so important from a theoretical perspective? So as I already mentioned, the standard model, at least in its simplest form, doesn't allow for neutrino masses. This is because the way we write down a mass term for the other fermions, electrons for instance, requires two different type of fields, a left-handed field and a right-handed field. Now this, uh, well you might notice, this breaks uh, SU2, in fact uh, the way we actually write down this term is by coupling the left-handed doublet to the Higgs, and when the Higgs 
gets a VEV, now we generate uh, the neutrino, ma uh, the electron mass. Now, for neutrinos, there are no right-handed neutrinos. So we can introduce them, but that has problems, as I'll show you in the next slide. The other possibility is to have a Majorana mass term. So this uses only left-handed neutrinos, but the problem of this term, this breaks SU2, uh, so is not allowed in the standard model, but could arise from higher theories, as I'll show you. So the reason why a lot of theories don't like the explanation of Dirac masses for neutrinos is that now if we do what uh, um, I already said before, we couple the left-handed doublet to the Higgs and the right-handed neutrino to generate neutrino masses, that uh, the mass will depend on the coupling between the Higgs and the neutrinos. And the coupling needs to be extremely tiny. Now when we look at uh, masses in the sub-EV region, the coupling needs to be smaller than 10 to the minus 12, 10 to the minus 13. Such value is somewhat unnatural from a theoretical perspective. A lot of theories don't like that unless uh, there's a way to explain why it is so small. And some, for example, some examples in extra dimensional models are being put forward. So what instead uh, theorists uh, very much prefer are Majorana masses. So Majorana masses actually could come from a higher <coughs> energy theory. Now, if you look at the dimension, so now this is the SU2 conserving term that I showed you before. I'm, I'm coupling the left-handed doublet with the Higgs, uh, and when the Higgs gets a VEV, this generates a Majorana mass term. Now, the dimension of this term is a five, so one needs to suppress in the Lagrangian uh, this term by uh, mass here. And so the way we can look at it is that if we had enough energy to zoom in, um, in for these interactions, what we would see is a virtual particle being exchanged, a virtual particle that are very high scales. So this is what, uh, uh, for example, CISO models do. So now in this case, we don't need very tiny couplings with the Higgs. We just need a very heavy mass to be exchanged. And this generates very light neutrino masses in what is considered a natural way. So now, what uh, can be the particle that uh, can be exchanged? Well, that depends on the type of uh, uh, extension of the standard model. So uh, the simplest case is which we exchange a singlet fermion in between. This is the CISO type one, which is some of the uh, standard extension for neutrino masses. But there are many other possibilities. For example, one can exchange a scalar triplet, a fermionic triplet, and there are many different extensions which have been looked at. Clearly, the question question is, what is the new physics scale, the new energy scale, so where the new particles and the new interactions uh, will uh, be there, but that is a completely different uh, story. Let me give you one example. This is the simplest case, the simplest extension, which is CISO type 1. And this, for example, can be easily embedded in gut theories, so grand unification theories where the couplings merge together at some very high energy scale. Now, one introduces a right-handed, very heavy particle, a right-handed neutrino, and one allows for a perfectly SU2 um, conserving coupling between the left-handed doublet, the Higgs, and this very heavy neutrino. Here, the coupling doesn't need to be very small, can be as large as uh, the other, um, for the other fermions. For example, uh, this could give a, a Dirac mass of the order of the GV, like for the tau, uh, for all the other um, quarks. The point is that this heavy right-handed neutrino can have a mass, a Majorana mass term, which is very, very heavy. And when I diagonalize this mass matrix to find the values of the neutrino masses, I see here this very heavy mass suppression at work. So if I want to take Dirac masses in the GV range, and now I assume that this mass scale is close to the gut scale, 10 to the 14 GV, then I get neutrino masses in the EV scale, which is what I want. So that's why people consider these type of models very natural. They can be easily embedded in gut theories, and they give us the right values of neutrino masses without requiring tiny mixing angles. Now notice that this is a Majorana type of mass now and is very different than from what I discussed before the Dirac masses. So the kind of extension that I do of the standard model in order to understand neutrino masses really depend crucially if you're talking about Dirac versus Majorana. So one has to keep in mind that the implications of such determination are really very important from a theoretical perspective. So now how are we going to determine neutrino masses? 
So there are different uh, strategies which are employed in particle physics and they give different type of information. So we have neutrino oscillations. These are sensitive to the ordering. Remember that they, they, if the two lightest neutrino masses are the lower ones or the um, heavier ones. Um, we have direct searches of the masses. This is, for example, Catherine, which is going to take data in a couple of years. And we have neutrino lesable beta decay. So let's look at these one by one, starting from neutrino oscillations in long baseline neutrino oscillation experiments. So now when neutrinos travel in one of these experiments, now they are produced in an accelerator complex, for example, let's say a minus in the US, they are produced at Fermilab, but then they travel hundreds of kilometers before they are detected, for example, in the minus experiment or NOVA experiment. So because the Earth is curved, clearly they go through a large amount of matter, and matter is made of of electrons, protons, and neutrons, and not their antiparticles. So what one expects is that there are these effects which change the effective mass of the neutrinos in matter, and these effects depend on being particles or antiparticles. So the effects will be different if, if we are looking at neutrino channel or the antineutrino channel. Now, Specifically, the oscillation probability in matter depends on the mixing angle, uh, which is changed here. This is the mixing angle in vacuum, and this is the effect of matter. This is the number density of electrons in matter that we know quite well. It just depends on the, the density uh, of, uh, of the Earth, which is around 3 grams per centimeter cubed. So notice this uh, formula here. This is for neutrinos. For antineutrinos, we have a plus sign here. So now, in particular, there is a point in which uh, these two terms in the denominator could cancel out uh, with each other. And that depends on the sign of delta m square. Now, if we go back and look um, at the normal ordering with respect to inverted ordering, here, delta m squared, which is m3 squared minus m1 squared. In this case, this is positive. In this case, m3 squared minus m1 squared is negative. So the sign of the delta m square relates directly to the type of ordering we have, normal or inverted ordering. So if we go back to this formula for the mixing angle in matter, you can have an enhancement of the probability, which depends on the mixing angle in matter, if delta m square is positive. If instead delta m square is negative in the inverted ordering, then I cannot have here um, a cancellation, and I have just a suppression of the probability. So I, I can go and measure the probability, and I can try to see if there's an enhancement or a suppression. And in particular, I can compare that with the antineutrinos, where I have a plus sign. So I will have the opposite case. I will have an enhancement in the inverted hierarchical case and a suppression in the uh, normal hierarchical case. And you can see this here. This is the probability of oscillation. This is for a baseline of 1,300 kilometers as a function of the neutrino energy. And this is the probability for the normal hierarchy. And this is for the, the probability for the inverted hierarchy. And you see this big difference which comes in by, by these matter effects that I already uh, just mentioned. So these matter effects are being used by atmospheric neutrino oscillations. And what has changed uh, kind of all this discussion in the past year is, has been the discovery of theta-1,3. Now, these effects, actually, we can see it back from this uh, um, uh, probability here, so this uh, expression here, depend on the mixing angle. And it's for this experiment, it depends specifically on the mixing angle theta-1,3. Now, last year, we had the discovery of theta-1,3, and actually, we measured it to be quite large. So all these effects are enhanced uh, with respect to what we thought a couple of years ago. And so, indeed, now, experiments like atmospheric experiments like Penguin Ice Cube, for example, will be able to have sensitivity to the mass hierarchy, at least at some confidence um, level. The where we, we are going to have probably the most uh, um, uh, uh, robust confirmation of the mass hierarchy is uh, via long baseline neutrino oscillation experiments, because in this case we control very well the energy spectrum, the distance, and all the various effects. Now, it's true that this enters together with the CP, um, the determination of the CP phase delta, but at the same time, because theta on 3 is so large, the generalities that before were thought to be very important in determining the mass hierarchy, in reality, are going to be subdominant, at least uh, for determining 
the ordering of masses. So the experiments that uh, um, we can look at are super beams, and there are two which are already running. One is T2K, which has uh, a month ago provided uh, seven sigma uh, evidence for theta 1,3, and NOVA, which is due to start uh, any day now. We should have started a month ago, so it should start in a few weeks with uh, a beam. And then there are plans, uh, more uh, kind of uh, um, ambitious plans for the future, LBNE, SPL, Laguna, LBNO, etc. Super beams are essentially extensions of current running experiments, like MINOS. The way we produce the neutrinos are in pion decays, and then because the pions are accelerated at high energies, that produces a beam of uh, muon neutrinos. And one looks for the change of muon neutrinos into electron neutrinos, which is sensitive to those probabilities that I showed before. If one wants to go to kind of even more more ambitious and precise experiments, one will have to go to a muon factory, a uh, neutrino factory, uh, where ne neutrinos are produced from muon decays. And so, but that is come sometime uh, for uh, the far future. So this is what the T2K and NOVA can do in the next uh, six, seven years or so. As I said, there is some degeneracy with the delta phase. So this is the mass hierarchy discovery. And you see that that can happen for roughly 40% of the values of the delta phase. So without going into the details, this tells us that there is some chance uh, that uh, the mass hierarchy can be um, determined at a couple of sigma in the next uh, six, seven years. But if we really want to be able to determine that uh, with uh, more confidence, uh, we need to go to these other experiments that I already mentioned, LBNE, for example. This uh, is where the beam will be produced at Fermilab and will travel 1,300 kilometers to the Sudan, um, uh, to the home state mine. Now, these experiments are currently under discussion, and so the next uh, couple of years will be critical in seeing which directions uh, we will go. And this will determine the hierarchy at five sigma with, uh, within a few years. So now, long base line neutrino oscillation experiments determine the mass hierarchy, but now the other very powerful probe we have is neutrino as double beta decay. I mean, the main physics goals of these experiments are the determination of the nature of neutrinos, whether they are Dirac or Majorana. But in doing so, can they also give us information on the neutrino masses? Now, neutrino less double beta decay is a process in which two neutrons go into two protons and two electrons, and they exchange this live virtual Majorana neutrino here. And the half-life time depends then on the neutrino parameters, in particular the masses, the mixing angles, and these phases here, which are called the CP uh, Majorana phases, on which we have no information, no we will ever have. So these are need to be treated completely as uh, free parameters. So depending on the values of the masses, we can have different values for this parameter, which controls uh, the half-life time. This is called the effective Majorana mass mm -hmm. parameter. So in the case of normal hierarchical spectrum, which I remind you is M1 much smaller than M2, much smaller than M3. You see that here the terms are all very small. This is small because it's controlled by delta M square solar, and this is small because it's suppressed by theta 1, 3. So the predictions for M effective are in the few milli electron volt region. Now, in the year inverted hierarchical spectrum instead, the dominant uh, contribution comes from the delta M square atmospheric. So we are in the few tens of milli electron volts. And if we are instead in the quasi-degenerate spectrum, then in this case, the mass is controlled by the uh, common mass, so it's quite large. So as you see, as the predictions are different, now if in an experiment I measure this effective Majorana mass parameter by measuring the decay rate, then I can kind of try to reconstruct in which spectrum I am, and I can actually compare that with cosmology. So now if I allow the minimal mass to vary continuously, these are the regions I, I obtain. This is the effective Majorana mass parameter. This bluish and red region here correspond, corresponds to the inverted ordering. This uh, yellow and red correspond, corresponds to the normal ordering. So, and experimentally, we are happy here right now. There has been uh, this uh, year quite a few new results, EXO 200, Kamlanzen, and Gerda, which have brought down the bound roughly to 0.2 um, electron volts. But there are plans to go down by a factor of 10 and even possibly more so, so probing the region. So now imagine that you find, for example, an experiment uh, which gives us a value of M effective in this region here. We would know that we are in the inverted ordering or for a tiny value 
uh, tiny range of the masses in the normal ordering. If we don't find anything down to 10 milli electron volts, then the, the only possibility is that either neutrinos are Dirac particles or the, um, the ordering is normal. And notice that in that case, this is the prediction for the normal hierarchical spectrum. But if uh, the masses, if there's some partial degeneracy, we could have even a perfect cancellation or values which are much larger. So depending on uh, the value of a mean, we have various possibilities. I'll come back to that right at the end of my talk. So I already mentioned that is possible to extract information on neutrino masses. For example, if uh, M effective is bigger than 0.2 electron volts, then we know that the spectrum is quasi degenerate, but now this is start being at, um, kind of constrained by current uh, experiments. And the other important point, if we don't find anything down to 10 milli electron volt, we know that the ordering is normal or neutrinos are Dirac particles. The other, I want to make here a point. These, um, these constraints and this measurement of neutrino masses have some possible model dependence. Now, uh, looking at neutrino level beta decay through line neutrino mass exchange is uh, the simplest case and the most natural case as well. However, neutrino level beta decay could be mediated also by other mechanisms. And so there could be the cancellation that contributions from light neutrinos and other mechanisms cancel partially out, or neutrino level beta decay is due mainly to these other mechanisms and not from light neutrino masses. So there is some model dependence here that one has to keep in mind when one trusts uh, the constraints on neutrino masses. It's also to be said that, that most of the other mechanisms, as far as the masses are quite heavy, the masses of these new particles which are introduced are heavy, they tend to be suppressed uh, um, with respect to the light neutrino exchange. So it's very difficult to arrange for models in which the heavy, uh, the heavy um, physic contribution um, dominates with respect to the light neutrino ones. So there is some model dependence, but it's also true that the light neutrino mass exchange remains the simplest and the most natural explanation if we see neutrino as double beta decay. And the way we look for it is that this is the two neutrino double beta decay uh, spectrum. So one measures the energy of the electrons coming out from the decay. And this is a measured spectrum for many nuclei. Right at the end, as there are no neutrinos carrying away any energy, the two electrons need to carry away all the energy available in the decay. So it's gonna be a small peak right at the end of the spectrum. And by looking at this feature, now that we have already strong constraints, for example, this is what we would expect uh, from XO200. This is the double beta decay. And uh, here, right at the end, one would expect a tiny peak. As you see, these are not easy um, measurements to do because there are lots of backgrounds, but they are quite well understood. And in this way, one can put constraints on the half lifetime and conversely on the effective Majorana mass parameter at the level of, as I already mentioned, 0.2 EV for the masses. What is also exciting is that there are many experiments which are going to be planned for the future. So no plus, uh, next, uh, Majorana, Cobra, Super Nemo, etc. So these bounds are going to improve uh, very significantly. The only model independent constraint on neutrino masses come from beta decays. Now in beta decays, one looks at the spectrum of electrons coming out of the beta decay. If neutrinos have a mass, we have this specific change in the shape of the spectrum right at the end. Because also in this case, the electron, if neutrinos are massless, can take away all the energy. While instead, if the neutrinos have a mass, they will be able to take away all the energy minus the neutrino mass. And so by looking at this tiny change, one can put constraints on neutrino masses. Here, there's no model dependence. If neutrinos have mass, we expect to see this. And so these bounds are the strongest and most robust that we can possibly have. The problem is that they are also the, some of the weakest in the sense that uh, this is Catherine. Catherine is under commissioning, is gonna start taking data in 2015. And this is the 90% uh, uh, limit on the neutrino mass as a function of uh, 
time. So once they start taking, immediately in, within a few months, they will reach the 0.4.3 EV uh, sensitivity, which is going to be important to compare to what we see in uh, cosmology. And uh, their ultimate reach is going to be down to 0.2 EV. Going beyond this is very difficult, and there is some R&D happening for other type of searches, but indeed, and this somehow we have reached probably uh, what is uh, the bound, uh, the limit for these type of searches. So just as a summary of from the particle physics uh, point of view, uh, we have neutrino oscillation experiments, which by looking at matter effects can determine the mass hierarchy. I haven't mentioned that also reactor neutrino oscillations by looking at the small effect of delta m square atmospheric over delta m square solar oscillations can also determine the mass hierarchy, and this is what Juno and Reno 50 plan uh, uh, to do. Now, beta decay experiments, as I already mentioned, these are the most robust, but they can probe neutrino masses only in, quasi, in the quasi degenerate spectrum. And then finally, neutrinoizable beta decay is very sensitive, but measure a combination of masses and uh, phases. So somehow one has to keep in mind that one will, one, uh, what one can extract is uh, some information on the combination of these uh, parameters. How much time do I have? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Thanks. So now let's look at cosmology. Now, neutrinos were in thermal equilibrium early on. They decouple around 1 MeV. And uh, since then, uh, they really don't uh, do much. They redshift. Now, the impact on big man nucleosynthesis quite uh, significantly. And then uh, uh, they contribute to the uh, relativistic energy density of the universe. Still, they become non-relativistic when the temperature drops uh, below their mass. So they will uh, affect the CMB, and they will affect uh, the uh, meta power spectrum. And these are the two ways in which we can try to get information about neutrino masses. Cosmology, in the past years has become a very powerful tool to actually do so. Now, in the CMB, pre-Planck, um, the way to constrain masses, from, in particular from Planck, was to look at the impact on the change of the time of matter radiation equality. And this would lead to an enhancement here of the peaks and a shift due to the uh, change in the sound horizon of the peaks of the CMB. Now, and the bounds that one could find were typically of the order for the sum of the masses uh, of around 1, 1.5 uh, EV with W map. Now, uh, Planck has changed that, has improved significantly on these bounds down to 0.66 EV at 95% confidence level by looking at the lensing of the CMB um, signal. Now, notice that this is the sum of the masses. We are in the quasi-degenerate regime, which means that each mass would be 0.22 EV. So already, this would tell us that Catherine should find no signal. And so that would be very interesting to see uh, what actually Catherine uh, finds and see if there's a compatibility or not between the cosmological observations and the direct measurement of uh, the neutrino masses. Now here you see their probability uh, as a function of the sum of neutrino masses. And there is some dependencies on the assumptions that one makes. For example, if one uh, weakens uh, the uh, impact of the lensing, then one sees that one can go to uh, higher values of the masses. So one has to keep in mind some dependence there. The other very uh, powerful probe is the meta power spectrum. Now, neutrinos, uh, they become non-relativistic, as I said already, when the temperature drops below their mass, but they still remain uh, quite fast-moving power particles, and the structures cannot grow below the their free streaming length, which is typically at quite small scales, uh, 0.11 um, inverse megaparsecs. Now, as you see here, the, well, first of all, the impact is purely gravitational. So there's no dependence on the mixing angle. There's only dependence on the masses. And there's no way to distinguish the different uh, components, uh, the three different neutrinos. So uh, it will depend on the sum of uh, the masses. Now, if we look at uh, EV neutrinos, this will, go, will give a contribution to the energy density of the universe around uh, 10%. Um, 1%. And then, so that could be 
somewhere 10% of the dark matter um, contribution, so this F new factor. And here you see the suppression of the meta power spectrum when I go from a 10% of the dark matter density down to a 1%. So you see it is a quite large effect you see here directly into uh, on the power spectrum. Now, clearly what we have to do is measure the meta power spectrum or reconstruct better the um, measure uh, the meta power spectrum at quite small scales. There are various ways to do that. One can use galaxy surveys. These have been used already quite a lot in combination first with WMAP and now with Planck to put constraints which are down in the 0.1, 0 0.2 EV. Again, for the sum of the masses. So for what I said before, 0.1 EV corresponds to inverted hierarchical spectrum where I sum the two heaviest masses, which each of them is 0.05 EV. So their sum is 0.1 EV. Now, if I can go lower than that, then I can start distinguishing if instead uh, the uh, spectrum is with normal hierarchy. In that case, I have only one heavy mass, which is 0.05 EV. So between 0.05 and 0.1 EV is the difference between normal hierarchy and inverted uh, hierarchy. Now, another way to trace um, the underlying meta distribution is looking at the intergalactic low density gas through the Lyman Alpha Forest or through the um, 21 centimeter lines due to the neutral hydrogen. First at the high redshift in the intergalactic medium and then at the lower redshift in the dense clumps. And all of this, I mean, there's a very wide literature here, report only some references. But there are two main issues which need to be kept under control. One is the bias. Now, you're measuring something which is visible, for example, uh, the galaxy distribution. Now that needs to be related to the underlying meta distribution, which is really what we are interested in. And that is done through the bias. So we need to know the bias and have that under control very well if we want to extract the information about neutrino masses. The other issue is that now we are going into a regime in which the growth of structure is highly nonlinear. And so we need to have to trust both the theoretical understanding and the end body simulations, which somehow have started a few years ago, including neutrinos, and somehow are developing further in this direction. The other way to look at neutrino masses, and in particular the meta power spectrum, is through lensing of galaxies. So, and this allows to reconstruct uh, the um, integrated density profile of meta uh, between uh, the uh, galaxies and uh, the signal that we observe. Now, this is going to be extremely powerful. There are forecasts uh, for the use of Euclid, for example, which can bring down the uh, measurement of neutrino masses in this region, which distinguishes normal versus inverted hierarchy. So again, we are looking at very uh, small scales. So again, here, the theoretical understanding need to be at the percent level. And this is, for example, a forecast in which shows this, the measurement of the sum of neutrino masses um, versus the um, energy density in relativistic particles uh, measured through the N effective, the extra number of the um, uh, neutrinos. Um, this is a forecast for kind of small values. And you see how well you could reconstruct when you combine uh, Planck with uh, uh, the cosmic shear, so uh, weak lensing, galaxy clusters, and uh, uh, galaxy surveys. So in principle, as they depend on different parameters, you should be able to break the generalities and measure this down very well. As uh, I already mentioned, this is another uh, parameter which is very important, which is uh, the expansion of the universe. And again, I think that's actually a very important uh, um, effect to consider as uh, there could be different uh, evolutions, uh, so different sources uh, depends on the origin of uh, the accelerated expansion. And so this is not a forecast, this is actually measurement uh, using Planck data and combining that uh, with uh, galaxy surveys. And you see that as I include the dependence on uh, the value of W, and even more so if I include some um, redshift evolution of uh, W, then this kind of weakens uh, the constraints on the sum of the masses. So it's very important to use different probes, as different probes depend on different parameters in different ways. And so can constrain much better these um, the neutrino masses. Thanks a lot. So now I will use the remaining five minutes to put together particle physics and cosmology. So what can we learn 
if we now look at the complementarity of these searches. But I have to say, I think because the kind of implications that it has could be really groundbreaking, in particular, if we, one can determine, discriminate between Dirac and neutrino masses, then one has to be very careful that systematic errors are under control and uh, that uh, one uh, keeps in mind the type of uh, model dependence, so all the assumptions we go from both from the cosmological point of view in terms of the underlying cosmological model and also in the case of particle searches, as I already mentioned, for example, in case of neutrinoizable beta decay. So, but assuming that all of this under control, so we can really rely and uh, believe in the measurements that have been obtained on neutrino masses, so, well, the first case would be if, uh, uh, so Catherine starts the taking at least, uh, they expect to start data taking at the end of 2015. So in a few months, they actually could observe a measurement of a neutrino mass. And now, as I said, this is extremely robust. So this would mean that neutrinos have a mass of some fraction of <laughs> EV. Now, in the case of neutrinoizable beta decay, we have a prediction for the effective Majorana mass parameter the parameter that you can determine by looking at the decay rate between this uh, measured mass multiplied by 2 cos theta solar, 2 cos theta solar is roughly uh, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, and uh, the value of the mass uh, here. So we have a quite well-defined range. The range comes, as I discussed before, by the fact that I don't know the CP violating phases. But let's say that uh, the observations from uh, neutrino double beta decay are compatible with that. There's already, there will be already some tension here because now neutrino double beta decay experiments can go down to 0.2 EV in, uh, in mass, so this upper bound here. Now, from cosmology, we expect that the sum of the mass is gonna be three times this value here, so bigger than 0.6 EV. Now, if somehow we are right at where Planck has its bound, 0.66 EV, then if everything is compatible, we would know that neutrinos are Majorana particles at lambda CDM, at least from the point of view of the impact of neutrinos, is a, a good model. Now, what happens if instead, for example, if we trust Planck plus uh, galaxy surveys, the bounds are stronger than 0.6 EV already? Now, there must be some new effects in cosmology which somehow either mask the effect of uh, the neutrino masses or have got rid of neutrinos. Now, the problem is that the neutrinos, for example, could decay or could annihilate into other particles. Once one tries to do that in a real model, one introduces new interactions, new degrees of freedom, typically relativistic degrees of freedom, so there are additional constraints coming in. So indeed, it's not so easy to find models which can get rid of the impact of light neutrinos from a particle physics point of view. If instead the neutrino less double beta decay doesn't find uh, the, what we expect from uh, um, uh, the measurement from Catherine, then in that case we can have two possibilities. Either neutrinos are Dirac particles, this requires no information from cosmology, or there are cancellations between the light neutrino contribution and the heavy neutrino contribution to neutrino less double beta decay. One could think that theoretically that's very unlikely, but there there are models, they are not the most preferred models uh, from a theoretical point of view, but they are there, which can give very easily cancellations. For example, if I have a very low energy CISO, the contribution exactly cancel out and one will never be able to see neutrino less double beta decay. But uh, in that case, one has light sterile neutrinos and there are other searches that one can, um, uh, in which way one can look for them. Now, let's say that Catherine doesn't find anything. Now, we have two possibilities. The ordering can be either normal or inverted. And in particular, let's look at the inverted ordering. Now, long baseline neutrino oscillation experiments are very sensitive to this and are gonna give us a very kind of robust and precise answer to this question. So, let's assume that in our future long baseline neutrino oscillation experiments, or even in uh, Pingua reactor experiments, uh, Juno, we find that the hierarchy is inverted. Now, in this case, we have, first of all, predictions for neutrinoizable beta decay. If it is the normal hierarchical spectrum in which I neglect the lightest of the masses, I have a range which is allowed for M effective. And let's say that we observe that. So first of all, we know the neutrinos are Majorana particles. Now we can look at cosmology. Now, if the spectrum is normal hierarchical, 
the two masses are 0 0.05 EV each. I sum them up, I expect the sum to be 0.1 EV. So if this is what the observation gives me, then I know that lambda CDM again, from the point of view of neutrinos, works very well. But I could find that the sum of the masses is smaller than EV, so the same considerations that I made before would apply in this case. There need to be either some particle physics effect, new interactions with which we can get rid of neutrinos in the early universe, or there are some additional extensions of the lambda CDM which mask the effect of neutrinos. Or there could be, we could even find that the sum is bigger. So then in that case, either we are not in the normal hierarchical spectrum, because you remember there's always an intermediate region, some partial degeneracy between the masses. In that case, the sum could be higher, but this will give me very important information about neutrino masses. Or there could be some new source of hot dark matter. For example, the simplest case would be to have some sterile neutrinos around. Now, from the point of view of neutrino as double beta decay, now, if we look at a signal which is not compatible within the range, if it is smaller, then again, we expect neutrinos to be, as before, either Dirac particles or there's some cancellation that we could hopefully be able to test. Or if they are higher, then it means that there's some additional contribution to neutrinoizable beta decay, which is not due to light neutrino masses. And then the other case is the case in which I have Let's assume that instead I, I have observed they have a hierarchy, the normal hierarchical one. So we can draw very similar conclusions. I would just want to point out the, the case in which now really the synergy between neutrino mass searches in neutrino double beta decay and cosmology is crucial. So let's say, for example, that we see um, the prediction for MEE is in the tens of milli electron volts. Now, but if you remember uh, what I said uh, um, before, uh, there is that region in the normal hierarchical spectrum. Remember where uh, the, in the M effective there is that cancellations which goes down and then the um, predictions go up again. Now by cosmology, we would be able to tell in which of these regions of the masses we are. So I can get very precise ma predictions for M effective and then I can compare that with the, the data uh, in neutrino double beta decay. And so for example, I see an incompatibility there that again, that would point towards Dirac particles. So I think the interplay is very important and I come to my conclusions. First of all, both from an experimental, phenomenological and theoretical point of view, determining neutrino masses is crucial. This has become one of the most important questions in particle physics since the discovery of neutrino oscillations in 1998. Now, the information we can get uh, can come from different sources. I mentioned Long Beach Line Neutrino Oscillation Experiment, Neutrino as Double Beta Decay, where the masses come in uh, combined together with the CP varying phases, and uh, Beta Decay, which is the most robust, but also somewhat the least sensitive of these probes. But there again, we have Catherine, which is gonna start in a couple of years, two years and a half or so. And then we have cosmology, which in the past uh, six, seven years has started playing a very important role in all all these searches and now comes in with information which is as uh, stringent as the one which comes from particle physics. And it's by combining these different sources and looking at their compatibility or not that we, we can try to pin down if the standard uh, picture for neutrino masses from cosmology and from particle physics is um, correct. And if not, we can try to understand what, how we have to extend both the standard, particle, the standard model of particle physics and or possibly the cosmological uh, picture. Thank you very much. Um. Okay, I think, unfortunately, I think we have to, we have to go to lunch. So maybe we, okay. can, <laughs> we can ask questions in private. Um, just a quick announcement about lunch. Um, it turns out to be easiest if you find your table first and sit down, and then you will actually be called to, to get your food instead of all of us queuing at the same time. So in the past, that, you know, it sounds funny, but it has worked out better that way. Um, okay, and then parallel sessions will start at 2 o'clock. I kept them more or less fine. Yeah, you did, you did. You did.